Today's episode is sponsored by MeUndies. MeUndies only cares about making the most comfortable underwear you've ever experienced. MeUndies are twice as soft as cotton. How can you ever have a truly bad day if your underwear is that soft? MeUndies will deliver your new favorite pair of underwear right to your door. A better day guaranteed. You can only get them on the MeUndies website with free shipping in the U.S. and Canada. Everyone listening to this gets 20% off their first order. Go to MeUndies.com slash WTF. That's 20% off your first order, MeUndies.com slash WTF. We're also sponsored today by Sonos. Sonos is the smart speaker system that streams all your favorite music to any room or every room. Control your music with one simple app and fill your home with pure, immersive sound. I've got it in my living room, my bedroom, the bathroom, and right here in the garage. I can play a different song out here while people in the house are listening to something else, or I can blast the same track in every room. Check out more at Sonos.com. That's S-O-N-O-S dot. Com. All right, let's do the show. <laughs> All right, let's do this. How are you? What the fuckers? What the fuck buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fuck nicks? What the fucking Easters? What's happening? I'm Mark Marin. This is my show, WTF. Welcome to it. Happy you're here. Hope you're holding up. I should tell you that my guest today is the uh, creator of uh, the musical Hamilton. He wrote and performed uh, in it uh, an amazing piece of work. Lynn manuel Miranda is here today. Talk to him in a little bit. What's happening? I will be in Nashville at the James K. Polk Theater this Saturday, the 19th. You can go to WTFPod.com for tickets. I'm also going to be... In Chicago. Chicago is on December 3rd. Two shows at the Vic. A 7.30 and a 10, I believe. Again, WTFPod.com slash tour. You get the information for tickets, links to tickets. Come on out. Let's hang out and talk. Let's hang out and talk. I did a very um, courageous and uh, somewhat uh, scary thing today, uh, I, I did, you know, I did something I, I didn't think I would do. I didn't think I had it in me to do it. Um, but maybe, uh, some of you can do it too. I don't know. I, maybe it's not right for you. Maybe it's too much, but, uh, I'm pretty proud of myself. I'm proud to be American. Uh, and I'm also proud that, uh, that I took Twitter off my phone. Fucking gone. Hit the little X, watched it go away and felt a relief. I felt a freedom from the bondage of self-induced post-traumatic stress disorder, of feeling the need to connect and react to a never-ending stream of garbage from the Internet cesspool. I'm not saying that about my friends. You can all fight the good fight how you're going to fight it, but uh, I needed to collect my thoughts. I needed to look around me. I needed to uh, be in my car and not risking my life to uh, to react angrily to a tweet. I haven't really tweeted much in a couple of days because... I, I, I don't, the energy is being misused. There's no way to, uh, let love in and, uh, figure out what the next right thing to do is if you're constantly consumed and jacking your goddamn endorphins and jacking your, uh, cortisol levels to, to skyrocketing survival heights just by engaging with eggs and, uh, hostile avatars of different sorts the uh the fronts of cowards and just people that want to annoy you fuck it i got it off my phone and now i can walk in it's weird you get this it's almost like a phantom limb thing where you i reach for my phone and i gotta oh it's not there whoo a little bit of panic hey wait a minute say hi to that guy how's it going man i'm all right what that's a sample of dog food? I don't have dogs, I have cats. Curly, uh, clearly an odd reference, but it just happened down at the pet food store. So look, I'm trying to get on with my life and process my feelings, but it does hang over you like some sort of, uh, chronic diagnosis, you know? Like, you know, hey, that was, I was, that was a pretty good omelet. Oh, God. That's, that's happening. I think I can go see a movie. That was, that was a good movie. That was great. It was a sci-fi movie, kind of a fantasy. 
that was sort of uplifting, alien save the world kind of thing. Yeah, I just went and saw uh, Arrival. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. I'm going to think about it a little bit. Oh, my God. That's still happening. It still happened. So that, you know, that, that's going to be the way it is. Yeah, uh, for those of us who feel that way. And yeah, there's, there's two sides to everything. But look, you know, I, I went out and, uh, did some comedy. I started to really kind of parse, you know, what it means to be a comic, to stand up and, and, and be heard and be funny and not to be, uh, too strident, but try to figure it out from a human point of view. That's the problem with the, Right now, with the vulnerability element, is that you know we have to maintain vulnerability and we have to move through the world with courage and and a certain shamelessness of uh, who we are and and you know what we do and and what we contribute to the world. Now things that were once comfortable are uncomfortable, and that could just mean going to the fucking store for some people. But we are all Americans, and uh, you know we some of us got to push back, some of us got to fight, some of us got to resist. Do whatever you need to do to make your life mean something and to help other people. To help other people. And the cats. Got to help the cats. Right? With the holidays almost here, you don't have time to go to the post office. There's traffic and parking, and it will be packed with everyone mailing holiday gifts and packages. So do what I do. Use Stamps.com instead. With Stamps.com, you can avoid all the hassle of going to the post office during the busy holiday season. Everything you would do at the post office, you can do right from your desk. Buy and print official U.S. postage using your own computer and printer. Print postage for any letter or package the instant you need it. Then the mail carrier just picks it up. It's only 50 Fifteen ninety nine a month. That's it. No long term multi year commitments like those postage meters require, and no markups on postage. In fact, you'll even get special postage discounts with stamps. dot com. I use it, and you should too. Right now, sign up for stamps. dot com and use my promo code WTF for this special offer. Start a four week trial plus a one hundred ten dollar bonus offer, including postage and a digital scale. Don't wait. Go to stamps. dot com before you do anything else. Click on the microphone at the top of the home page and type in WTF. That's stamps.com. Enter WTF. It was good to get out and do some comedy, see the see the, the other comedians at the store, how they're doing it, what's happening, communing with the folks who come out with the audiences, speaking your truth. Can't stop that. It was good, man. It was good. When things get hairy and things get scary... Uh, I didn't plan out that rhyming. The uh, the intensity of of life in front of you, you know, vibrates with uh with a uh, with a uh, an immediacy. You know, it's a it's it's a time now. If you're feeling uh, vulnerable, to lean on people that you love, get closer to people, go out in the world, say hi to people, make sure people are you know being nice. Maybe saying hello to the uh, to the clearly sad person. Help people that need help. Leonard Cohen passed away, 82. Great run. Left some amazing work, which is the best you can really hope to do in this life. And I spent the other night, the night that he passed away, or the night that I heard he passed away, spinning some of those uh, albums. Songs from a room, I think, is, uh, the one I listened to. And I was, uh, I was a late comer to Leonard Cohen. I, I tried and I tried and I always knew he was great and I, and I knew it was good, but it was not connecting with me. And I guess it's maybe, maybe just for me, it was as I got older, I could deal with it. And I, you know, and I'm a poetry guy. There's no doubt about that. I'm not necessarily a lyrics guy, but I'm definitely a poetry guy and, and just, uh, some of it got so much deeper for me as as I got older and I guess as he got older, but I went back way back and listened to 12 songs. And uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to have the work that that guy did, a real Zen master, a real Buddha of the song. He will be missed, but we have his stuff. We have his stuff. That's the beautiful thing about music. You have the stuff. And th- this other very uh wonderful thing happened and I, I don't really use the word wonderful that much because I, I don't love it don't I don't love the word but uh, uh, someone reached out to me a fan of the show 
and she she just said that you know she had all these records uh that she wanted to give to me and you know i don't know who she is and she doesn't know if the twitter account's really me so i i you know i message her i go is this for real I, yeah of course i'd love to to take some records off your hands and she goes yes and you know we met at my office and she brought over like 600 records vinyl records that i find out were her her late father's collection and and it 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 almost felt like this you know you know i could tell that it was a heavy thing this is a loaded a loaded shipment that i'm getting but she needed to let go of it and I offered her money. She didn't want money. She just wanted them to be appreciated. And uh, I had no idea what was in those boxes. She said he took very good care of them. And that, uh, you know, she couldn't move around. You know, every time she moved, she had to swept these boxes. And it felt heavy to me. But then I felt like I, not only do I love records, and of course I want records, but I will appreciate them. I can be the custodian you know, obviously not entirely emotionally, but of these records and, and, you know, and, and accept the responsibility. I know some of you are thinking like some responsibility getting a bunch of free records, but I thought it was a lovely gesture and I didn't take it lightly. And there are some great records in there, things I never heard before, things that I avoided, some prog rock that I just never, never really paid attention to. There's some records in there that I think that maybe Maybe this gift is something I don't even understand yet. That somewhere in her father's collection might be a record that changes my fucking life. So I, I, I hope she knows that, uh, that that could happen. That could happen. I'll let her know. Her name's Kristen and, um, it's lovely to meet her and, and I, and I feel the weight of the records and I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to listen to new things. And I'm going to uh, honor your late old man. So thank you for those. All right. Do, do, you, do you find yourself without any time to read the things you want to read? Audible is the perfect solution. Get audiobooks and listen to them on the go, at the gym, during your commute, anytime. Audible.com has audiobooks from leading publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazines, newspapers, and more. Their app is free and works on iPhones, iPads, Androids, and Windows phones. You can also download and listen on your Kindle Fire in over 500 MP3 players. If you want some suggestions, how about getting Hamilton, The Revolution, which is co-written and narrated by our guest today, Lynn manuel Miranda. Or you can listen to the book that inspired Lynn to write Hamilton, Ron Chernow's unabridged biography of Alexander Hamilton. Audible.com also has the great listen guarantee. If you decide you don't like the book you choose, no worries. You can exchange any book you aren't happy with for another title anytime. No questions asked. Audible.com is offering a free 30-day trial membership. Go to audible.com slash WTF today to start your free trial. That's audible.com slash WTF. So what's the point, right? What's the point? Well, I think the point is you got to find the courage to be who you are. Look, there's a lot of people out there, left, right, people dealing with addiction, exclusion, you know, broken hearts, grief, angry, angry hope. Reluctant hope, complete defeat. But fuck it, man. You know, we got to be who we are, and you got to believe who you are as a good person, and and you got to act on that now. And you got to be aware and vigilant of, of people that, that need some support. We got to get each other's backs. All people. Seriously. I, you know, I'm a reluctant optimist, but I'm not going to surrender to PTSD of, uh, the onslaught of, uh, social media platforms or anything else. You know, sometimes in this life, it requires courage just to go out in the morning. You know, sometimes for people, that's the courage has to have, they, every day they got to deal with that. For years. That's just the way it is. But um, I'm wary, but I feel good. My guest today is uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda, who uh, created the musical Hamilton, 
which I saw in New York, and it was phenomenal. And it was a beautiful, there's nothing better than people collaborating to do something amazing and proactive. That, that I can tell you. And in, in the arts, that's certainly something that enriches life. Don't forget that if you're in the arts, because Hamilton was a, a real transcendent experience for a lot of reasons that I was able to talk to Lynn about. And, uh, I, maybe if you don't listen to the show all the time, I told you about how when I was there, um, he knew where I was sitting and as they were doing their curtain call, he looked over at me and, uh, he mouthed, Boomer lives. That was pretty nice. Pretty nice moment. And it was like, it was amazing to sit here and talk to him. He's doing, uh, he co-wrote the, the music and performed some of the songs for the new Disney movie, Moana. Lynn and I do a little singing. I will tell you that. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. This is me talking to uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda here in the garage. You want cans? Sure. Have you heard me ask that before, Lin-Manuel? Oh, please pronounce it Manuel. Just call Manuel? Me, call Lin me Manuel? Lin. Yeah, that's much better. Lin Man- Manuel, I can do. Yeah. I can do it. You can also just do Lin. That's fine. Is it? Yeah, yeah. I was told by people that you absolutely will walk out <laughs> if I say Lin. They're very sweet to protect me, but it's actually what I've been called on. Lin Manuel. Yeah. I can do it, man. I grew up in New Mexico. <laughs> I can, I can, I can make the right sounds. All right. So, how do you, how often do you come out here? This is all. This is a new world for you. I've only ever been out here for for work. I had, yeah. a, I had a really surreal. Um, my first show uh, in the Heights played the Pantages. Right. And I lived. My first experience living in L.A. was living in the W on Hollywood and Vine. The worst. I mean, at the Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Yeah. For real. Oh, so you had to walk across that sad street with guys in costumes. It, it, guys in costumes. <laughs> and also like, but also like homeless teens coming out of the yeah, train horrible. that no one takes. And next to like this hotel where Drake is upstairs. Right. So it's the dream and the dream deferred on the same corner. Right. Uh, and how long were you here? I was here for five weeks doing the, uh, acting in that show. That's right. That was the first musical you wrote and mm-hmm. directed and produced. I didn't direct. No, no. Tommy Kale, who directed Hamilton, directed The same guy too. you've been with forever. Yeah, yeah. He's my dude. Like, I feel bad. I, I've not seen uh, In the Heights. That's all right. No, it's it's not all right. <laughs> I, I, I feel terrible. I <laughs> Because I know it was the first one. It was. It was. It, I mean, and nothing will ever be that. Like, I went from broke substitute teacher to Broadway composer when yeah. that opened. And you you were broke substitute teacher, but you weren't acting. You were, you, I mean, you were doing things. I was trying to act. The only role I'd gotten was I was a bellhop on the last season of The Sopranos. I'm try- I just watched it. Which episode? It was, uh, they're going to get rid of something or check on a body. They're go- trying to find the Haven Air Hotel. Oh, right. Right. And oh, right. So... <laughs> yeah, so I'm just like this tranked out bellhop who they ask where the haven is. and my lines were, I don't know, I don't know, and ride off. And I remember, and I'm I just watched it. You were out in front of the hotel and they were asking where the old hotel was and you were just sort of like dead eyed and, yeah. and they were like, what the fuck? And I'm so fucking green as an actor. You can actually see me look down for my mark. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I, I look down to see where I'm supposed to stop. That's a tricky thing, the marks. Yeah. Yeah, especially when they make them small because they're getting them on camera. So then you only have a dot. And you're like, how the fuck is that going to help me? Yeah. And, you know, it was an amazing first experience. One, because Gandolfini really was as kind and sweet as everyone. Like, stayed and did his scene, even though my side was second. Like, didn't have to be there for a bit player. That's so sad. But he stayed and and did the other side of the scene with me. He did. And it was late at night in the middle of New Jersey. And then... um, um, the other actor, oh my God, his name is escaping Paulie? me. Paulie. Yeah. Um, while I'm getting what his makeup, his he turns to me and he goes, hey, kid, when you do the line, do it with like a real, like fucking really <laughs> thick accent, you know, so it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so he's pitching me doing like a Latino accent and the makeup artist just waits for him to walk away and goes, he tries to direct everyone. Who comes yeah. Back. Paulie Galtieri <laughs> was the character. Tony Sirico. Tony Sirico, who's a very sweet guy, but kid, when you do it, do it with like a real fucking accent. He's really that guy. Yeah, it was it was amazing. I was like, oh, that's that guy. So I, you know, I, I obviously I, I saw Hamilton, and I was very, uh, uh, 
I almost start crying, not just because of the show, but you're walking off, you look right at me and say, Boomer lives. Boomer lives, baby. So I'm a big fan of the show. You're so sweet. Yeah, so, and it was, you know, you really look like yourself. So, and it, it's the logo of your podcast. <laughs> so it's weird to see the logo of this podcast in the 10th row. But you knew exactly <laughs> where I was. Yeah, well, I, I, it was. You seated me. It was you, like, you, you knew the seats. But no, not that. It was like spotting Waldo. I was just like, oh shit. <laughs> That's the cover of that podcast. I'm I Waldo. <laughs> you found the glasses. I did. But let's the, the, some of the things I found, and I don't want to have the same conversation you've probably had a million times about Hamilton, you know, outside of the success. But the one thing that knocked me out about it, and I kept thinking about, it, there were two things because I talked to you quickly backstage with the uh, the other actor. I don't know everyone's name. Right, oh, with Chris, probably. Yeah, sweet. Chris yeah, and I thought that was the original cast. I saw yeah. right the last. It was the last few weeks of the original yeah, cast. That's right. But the thing that was great about it, outside of many things, was I knew the streets. This was, it was New York. So it was like set in New York, yeah. and you're talking about these streets. I'm like, I have been to Gansevoort Street. Yeah. And and not only the fact that they've all been there that long, but that that history that we forget is New York history. Totally. I, and you never think of the founders in New York, right? But it, but but New York was the place. Yeah. It was one of the colonies. Yeah. And he's the New Yorker of the founders. I mean, that's the guy who never left Manhattan. Was that one of the reasons why you found a portal in this story? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was. I knew what most people know when I yeah. picked up that book. Really, Which at random, must be at not much. M- m- yeah, like I, he's, I actually, he's on the ten dollar bill. And and it was a ten. I knew he was, he was <laughs> like a, not a yeah. president, but on our money. And right. I knew that he got shot. And I also knew that his son died in a duel because I yeah. wrote a paper on that in eleventh grade. Like you did? Yeah. You know, I think, and I think I I wrote about that because you know I was like emo goth teenager I was like oh man his son died and then he died yeah, in yeah. the same way uh, it was before he died his son yeah, died, his son in, a died in a duel three years before he did and it was like pretty much the same spot in Weehawken like in the same area um, and I just thought that was really Weehawken. fucked up it's fucking that's New Jersey isn't that's it that's New Jersey yeah it's across the river it's like and we're just talking about the Sopranos it, it's so <laughs> weird the time travel necessary yeah. that you know and I think that places it historically especially for people who live in New York who have spent time in New York because our our ideas of what these places are are so detached from history. Right. So the story sort of roots itself. It, it It's time traveling, but it's also the geography is the same, and it makes it, it humanizes it just from the geography. Totally. Yeah. 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 So, so to walk around and say, I can't believe when we're in New York, which is what the Schuyler sisters do, is, is how everyone feels when they get here. And so right. you telescope time, and suddenly you relate to these characters. Right. It's not this other century in this other period of dress. It's like, oh, I'm in New York. Oh, I'm downtown. Oh, I'm like watching the energy here. And the meatpacking district is nice now. <laughs> yeah. And that's where a lot of it was, I think. A lot of those streets were down yeah, there. Yeah, meatpacking district is, is, yeah, is, is, is uptown. I mean, they were they were all down in the Battery, too. Yeah. Well, the, and also the thing about that is that somehow or another, uh, and, and, and this is part of the brilliance of the conception of it, is that you know you can have a multi-ethnic cast playing founding fathers and, and people in, of that time, which are not historically accurate, but it doesn't matter because it's New York. Right. It's true. New York, that's exactly true. Yeah, it's New York. And, and everyone lives here. And, right. And that's, that's one of the things and, and we no, love about And well, outside of the money... You know, if you're not talking right. about, uh, you know, uh, Malcolm X or Martin Luther King, where people are looking at it going, that doesn't look like him. No one gives a shit. Right. And that this is a human story. That's right. It, it, it actually, yeah. It, it and it's them, an immigrant story. It takes them off the money. Right. It takes them off the money to, to cast it that way. And, and, and honestly, it, that came out of the sound of what I was writing. It was like, well, this is a hip-hop R&B show. We need people who can pull that shit off. Right. Um, and that's, that was really sort of, and then Tommy, in his direction of it, elevated that to a principle. All right, well, then this is going to look like our country. Right. So, but, but, so what, so you get obsessed. So you write this story in in 11th grade, but, you know, whatever triggered the Hamilton thing, that book by, uh, uh, what's his name? Ron, uh, Ron Chernow. Ron Chernow. I didn't read it. It's a big book, and I, I don't, I, I don't seem to have the attention span to read a lot of books. But when you pick that up, I mean, what, what was the, what was the motivating force? So, so we said, you know, you know he's on the money. You had a vague idea of who he was. You knew he's from New York. But then you see this book. It, the book was everywhere. Was it one of those things where it's like, I'm going to read that book? I was just in the biography section at Borders. Like, I was just looking for a big book to read on vacation. When there were big bookstores. Yeah, yeah. when there were big bookstores. Yeah, right. It was the one in the Time Warner Center. So you're walking it's around. It's Forever 21 now, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I was walking around, and I knew I was going on vacation. And it where had were good you going? Re- I, was, I went to Mexico. It was like a, I had a week off from In the Heights. It was my first vacation from that show. How long did that run? That ran just shy of three years. 
And that was also uh, a story about about immigrants in this in in New York. Totally. But you were you've been a New York kid the whole time. Yeah, yeah you I was born in the Roosevelt Hospital. Grew up. Uh, Where's Roosevelt Hospital? That's uh that's actually not far from that borders. It's on like 59th and 10th. My son was born there two years ago. Uh, same hospital. Uh, yeah, it's on. Yeah, it's it's just uh, west of Columbus Circle. And you your parents grew up. Where'd you? What part of the city were you in? Uh, we moved. My parents met. Uh, at NYU, uh, grad school. Uh, they were both born in Puerto Rico. My mom grew up here. My dad came here for NYU. He sort of always- From Puerto Rico. From Puerto Rico. Got a full ride. Um, he's like the prodigy. Like, graduated college in Puerto Rico at 18. Uh-huh. Um, he's the doogie of Puerto Rico. Uh-huh. And then he came here to get his education. He was always gonna go back and he met my mom and stayed. And so when we, when I was born, um, my, Parents and my sister and I lived in the NYU grad housing. We lived in Silver Towers downtown. Where, where was in the village. that? What, what streets? That's like on Third Street. That's like right near McDougal and all. Not far from Hamilton. Yeah, yeah, that's totally <laughs> yeah. That, and then we moved uptown uh, to Inwood, uh, just north of Washington Heights, in like 1981. Um, it's pretty up there. It's like by Grant's Tomb. Around there? No, Grant's Further. Tomb's way downtown. No, it's like the way top, up there. like north of the Cloisters. Right, we're okay, just north okay. of the Cloisters. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and, and because I think those neighborhoods were in such rough shape, I had the rare sort of New York existence, grew up across from a park, um, you know, grew up in a house with a driveway in Manhattan. Right, because, because that's it where was, the houses are. Yeah. In, 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 yeah, in not wood. brownstones, like right. a house. Right. Um, and it was, you know, my dad tells the story, we bought the place and there was an uptown Irish tenant. And my mom's the one who interviewed and, and got the house. My mom's last name is Towns, which is a pretty ethnically indifferent last How name. How is that? Um, she's, uh, well, I mean, that's a whole other story, but my mom's half Mexican, half Puerto Rican. Towns is the Mexican side. Uh, if you go back far enough, it's actually, um, someone actually wrote an article. I found out about this on the internet. Yeah. Cause someone did my genealogy really? sort of for free. And you had no idea. I had some idea. I'd heard some stories, but someone really went and laid it out. Um, you know, Towns is a result of, this guy, um, his family owned slaves. He married, um, his, he, he married his mother's slave and ran away. Where was this? This is in way the fuck out west. And they basically, this couple, this interracial couple basically kept moving. The Towns family, David Towns and his wife, um, they kept moving. And then they would change the law and it would be illegal for them to live together and they'd move further south until they got to Mexico. Um, and then sort of grew up in Mexico and that's why Towns is a Mexican last name for our branch of the family. No kidding. So he started in the south. Yeah, he started in the south. And then kept, kept uh, moving because of his love. It's a passion story. Yeah, it's a passion story. They had kids and they just kind of kept moving. And they knew that and he didn't want to hide his love anymore, I guess. So he'd rather honor the love and keep moving yeah. to su- and to finally find a place where he could live. Yeah. And have his family. Right. And then for us. Is our, this the next musical? Are we talking about I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we, That's a we, hell of a story to read about yourself, though, online. It's I mean, a hell of a story in general because yeah. it, it seems to speak directly towards themes that you enjoy. Absolutely. And, and it's also, you know, you think, oh, well, p- my parents are both from Puerto Rico. But no, there's no one in this country that doesn't have, isn't tied to our fucking complicated racial history and the legacy of slavery. There's no one it doesn't touch. Right. You know, I, I never thought about it in those terms as a kid. I was like, well, both my parents were Puerto Rico. They grew up on an island and generations and generations. But no, it's it touches everyone. And I think I think that's it. true. Uh, you know, it, it, but not so, it, it's weird because I'm thinking about my own family and that my, you know, I go back it made two, three generations back to, you know, first generation immigrants from Europe. Right. So, like, my American history is a little shorter. Yeah. But that American history is much longer. Yeah. You know, a, so, all right, so you find this out when? After you wrote Hamilton? Yeah, this was, this was like. Recently? This was like nine months into the run. So uh, what does that propel you to think about? Do you think about, like, who are the other, do you have family that, that is, you're curious about that you might absolutely. know? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Towns is a, is a pretty, you know, if you meet most Towns, if they're not members of the Mexican side of the family, they're African American. And so that split happened at some point. And at some point, some of those, People in our family said, oh, well, we can pass. Right. You know, we can pass and we're Mexican and we're light skinned enough to pass on this side of the line. And so there's this amnesia whenever that split happened. Uh, but it did. It had to happen. Well, that, well, that reminds me of those of the, of the Jews that were expelled from Spain 
during the Inquisition and ended up in Mexico and sort of moved up in Mexico to New Me- They found like Sabbath candles in some Catholic churches that have been going right. on for hundreds of years and they didn't know why. Yeah. But it was a leftover tradition from the original Jews that were expelled that were now, you know, Mexicans. Isn't that incredible? It, it's, it is kind of incredible. Yeah. That they're these fa- these family histories. So when tell me more about like when you wrote the inspiration for the Heights clearly comes from you know the neighborhood you grew up in. So how many sisters and brothers do you have? I got one older sister. That's it. Yeah, yeah, she's six years older, and uh, you know we grew up. I, I had a sort of. Uh, I grew up in this, I grew up in a little Latin American country. I mean, if you go north of 181st Street, especially in the 80s, I mean, it was all, you know, it's classically, Washington Heights and Inwood have always been an immigrant community. First, uh, Irish and then tons of Jews after World War II and during World War II. Um, and then huge wave of, of Latinos, Cubans and Puerto Ricans, and then Dominicans in the 70s. So it was really a Dominican neighborhood when I was uh-huh. growing up, uh, in the 80s. Was there still like, like, uh, Irish was, Brigade Pub, right. Irish Eyes, right. Liffy 2, they're still there. Like, was there any Jewish, like, butcher, you know, shops? Oh, at- yeah, absolutely. Yeshiva University is still there. Right. I mean, Yeshiva is sort of the cornerstone of that community. I got an honorary doctorate from them. <laughs> um, and, uh, but that's also an important part of our community. And, and so it's always been, and, and I saw that starting to change. And Kiara, my co-writer and I sort of, we both live in that neighborhood now. And I remember when I was in college, the first Starbucks showing up and, you know, it's that thing you deal with of, you know, immigrants live where they can. They make the place special. Uh, and then, w- you know, and then there's a point where it gets so unaffordable that the people who play, make the place yeah. special can't then afford the, to live there anymore. The, the artisanal colonization begins. Correct. And first so, the yuppies and now like hipsters who refuse to call themselves yuppies because they don't dress like that. <laughs> yeah, right. The coffee shops are different. Yeah, the coffee shops are different. Yeah. And, and also, uh, but yeah, it was, it was, I was, I was seeing that shift happen and that's hard to dramatize. You know, it's hard to, you know, there's a lot of musicals where there's an outside force change. Gentrification is hard to dramatize. Yeah, yeah, in a way that feels um, compelling and feels high, high stakes. You know, you look at Fiddler on the Roof, like, oh shit, like, you know what the outside threat is in that world. It's intolerance and it's a wave of hatred that's coming and it's even going to break the bubble of Anatevka and this place where things have been done the same for hundreds of years. When did you first start engaging with, with musical theater that where, where it took on this life for you, where you could, you, you know, draw parallels uh, to your life? I mean, where where did you start thinking, like, when did you first see Fiddler on the Roof to, to. I saw Fiddler on the Roof in first grade. I, I, yeah. <laughs> my, my parents were obsessed with musicals. Um, really? They, they're of the generation that just had cast albums next to, you know, my dad had Man of La Mancha next to Dionne Warwick, next to Gran Combo and Celia Cruz. And uh, that's just the, the cocktail of music we grew up with. And also house. that's the benefit of living in New York is that not only it, when you're dealing with the, the sort of... Uh, the character of the neighborhood that that is is all ethnicities yeah is that you you know everybody's up in your face there's no way to to avoid right. contact and and engagement and and there's an acceptance to that because you learn how to to sort of say hello to everybody and appreciate everybody yeah. and I'm, and I'm also grown up uptown as hip hop is being born like and, and down the street you can see any fucking musical you want <laughs> and you can go see any symphony you want it's sort of a fascinating place that that all that stuff is available to you but your dad was what did he do my dad, uh, well, he, he, he came to, to the, to New York to study psychology. Yeah. And then didn't have the patience for it. Uh, you just, mean literally or, or uh, temperamentally? I'm, temperamentally. <laughs> like, he would do the practice sessions. I, 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 I shudder at the thought of being yeah. my dad's patient when he, cause my dad said he'd, he'd hear the person complaining. He'd go, you said that last week. Process it. Let's move on to the next thing. I only have 10 free sessions with you. <laughs> It's Whereas a, my mom stayed a psychologist. She's a great psychologist. She's still a kind of psychologist? She's still a clinical psychologist. And, in Manhattan. Um, in Manhattan. Yeah, she does a lot of um, custody cases. Uh-huh. Um, a lot of child psychology where she'll be sort of the one, you know, she'll interview and a, a family and sort of help make a recommendation where the kids should go. Um, and uh, really, like, heroic work she does. And my dad's in politics. My dad got really involved in school boards and community organizing uptown yeah. um, because my sister was going through school there, and he was just sort of fighting for her. And then he he kind of fell into politics. He It's exactly his skill set. He got hired as the mayor. 
the mayor Koch's advisor for Hispanic affairs in his last term. Uh, and he went from railing against the enemy to being like, oh, I'm the Hispanic spokesperson <laughs> for Mayor Cott. Um, and, and, Who is the enemy? Uh, well, you know, the enemy is underfunded schools, and right. the enemy is redistricting, and right. the enemy is, um, you know, getting, getting the same resources everyone else gets. Right. Um, and then he, you know, he, he actually really, um, flourished under Koch. Koch uh-huh. was a guy, um, a really complicated legacy. Um, but, but my dad learned a lot about how politics really happens there. Right. And, um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm the kid who's dragged along to meetings. You know, I remember sitting in Koch's office in the back, like coloring. Yeah. yeah. While like he, they're fighting about whatever they're fighting about in the corner. And Koch was nice to you? Yeah, Koch was really nice to me. I spoke at my dad's swearing in ceremony. Um, and I was, that was my first time in front of a microphone. I'm seven years old. Uh, and we, in, me and my sister, like, sort of did little speeches about our dad. And I'm in, like, in a little gray suit. Uh huh. Um, and so, yeah, Koch was always wonderful to us. And we'd go to Christmas parties at, like, Gracie Mansion. And it was really crazy. And I was, like, a little kid running around. Yeah. While, like, Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson are like, you know, I'm running between their legs. <laughs> They're just hanging out. <laughs> They're, They're around. Yeah. And so, and then he went from there to a lot of different nonprofit jobs. And then when I went to college, yeah. he quit the nonprofit sector because he couldn't afford to be a non in nonprofit anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and he started a, a private political consulting firm, and that's how he paid for my school, my education. But um, and he still has it. Yeah, he still has it. And he, and it's, it's interesting, like. Who are the, most of his clients? How does that work? Um, he did a lot, it does a lot of New York political clients. Um, he ran Freddie Ferrer's mayoral campaigns. He just got, uh, Adriano Espaillat as the first Dominican, uh, uh, elected to the House of Representatives. He just got him elected. Uh, that was one of the bright spots on oh, election right. day. Yeah, what happened? And, uh, but he also will represent, you know, he's, he's fighting against Herbalife because Herbalife is that giant fucking Ponzi scheme it's that like. Family thing, yeah. Yeah, that, that really takes out Latino communities. Like, really? It's really sort of entrenched in Puerto Rico. Um, and it's, it's. In terms of being an entrepreneurial poss- you know, option for people to get out. Yes, that doesn't really get anyone out. No, you just get the kit. You, you get, get your, you get, you get your friends and your family to buy three things. Yeah. So, and then it just sits in the closet. Right. So he fights against stuff like that. He fight, you know, he's been, he was hired to help, uh, you know, get the Yes Network in the Bronx because it was insane that like this cable company wasn't providing the actual Yankees games when the Yankees play in the mm-hmm. fucking Bronx. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. So it's, it's shit like that. Like that's the kind of stuff he, well, he that's does. what's interesting about New York politics because of the density of the population. There's, there's always a hands on sort of like fight to be had every morning every morning and and that you know it's all very practical you know yeah. it's not it's not abstract no no it's you know, not shit needs to happen right here right now it's not sort of like over there yeah it's here so that's it so you're growing you're growing up with you know a, a clinical psychologist two people trained in clinical psychology and you're already engaged in in the politics of race to a degree yeah because uh, the new know, york pol- new york politics is, is, is uh, not removable from race and also there's the the idea of of you know how do you make it in america that's hanging over everything absolutely and that's what the in and that was sort of the story of of in the heights right yeah 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 and it's and and it's also but the other thing within the heights the really sort of i think biggest reason that i started writing that show because i started writing that show when i was 19 years old was that i wanted to be i wanted to have a life in musical theater i just I was a kid who figured out who he was in the school play. That was that was my corner of identification in the hierarchy of high school because you get friends from different grades. So when shit gets real in your grade and someone hates someone or you're the bad guy that yeah. day, you can go hang out with someone in a different hallway. Right. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Like who's who's gonna graduate and you're gonna be sad, but like you have friends outside of the bubble of the life or death stakes that are happening. Emotional stakes. Emotional stakes. Yeah, yeah in that uh, uh, of 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 bullshit sort of status jockeying and bullies and, 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 you, you know. Uh, yeah, theater existed outside of that. Like, oh no, theater, yeah, it's its own, it's safe haven. Yeah, I, yeah, it's total safe haven and, and, even kids who were the bullies would would occasionally audition. Like right. no one doesn't want to be in the school play. 
<laughs> right. The, the, the guy who's a one note guy, maybe his one note will, will be the right one. They, yeah. they go, well, I'm, I'm the football player. You'd be perfect for the guy that's got one line. There's and a, then maybe they'll surprise you and sing well. There's a famous alum of my high school yeah. named, uh, well, his rapper name is Immortal Technique. Uh-huh. He's one of the most sort of politically ideological. He really made sort of an incredible life for himself as, uh, as a rapper. Right. He was a school bully. And he terrorized kids. He'd throw them in the garbage. I got thrown in the garbage by him. Isn't that interesting? And, um, yeah, he was a really angry kid. And, and it's, it's been wonderful to watch him grow up and like find a political outlet for that anger. Right. Uh, and. And to uh, know who the enemy is. But he was just Felipe and he scared the shit out of us. Right. And, uh, but he was in the school play. Like he got a part the senior year and I was like, oh my God, I'm in a fucking play with the dude who scares the shit out of all my friends. (laughs) And did, and were you surprised at that moment by, his like because it's like usually when someone is you know strutting like that or a bully like that that you know when they're in a different situation you can sort of see their vulnerability and yeah. and yeah he's got to memorize his lines <laughs> right right yeah. it's that's fr- that's a vulnerable place yeah yeah absolutely so all right so you see Fiddler when you're in first grade but then do you keep going to musical theater do you do you what do you no re- that's the thing I mean I think I'm like a lot of kids in that I fell in love with cast albums like. I've never seen Man of La Mancha. I've never seen Camelot. But my parents played them so much. I've got this idealized version of them in my head. Like just the, the the arc of the, the song. arc of the songs and the way those told the story. And I I sort of found, um, I always found that I I'm, I'm gravitated toward I gravitate towards music that tells stories. You yeah. know, it's uh, it's. I mean, Leonard Cohen yesterday, like Suzanne. I think you know. Oh I, I think of those gut puncher gut puncher um leonard cohen has my favorite quote about songwriting which is being a songwriter is like being a nun you're married to a mystery yeah <laughs> <laughs> hey, i don't know if the the i wonder if the world could handle a a, a musical not unlike um uh, mama mia or some of the other ones if it with leonard cohen's with leonard. <laughs> so, be a heavy evening it would be a heavy <laughs> evening like all right here comes the ninth verse of uh <laughs> you know um, but you know, yeah, he's a he's a, a tower. But anyway, it took me a long time for me to appreciate him. You, you know, like because I didn't quite, you know, register it because I'm not, you know, uh, a lyrics guy. And I've talked about this before. I, yeah. I'm a I'm a melody guy and I'm a, a, a fucking rock guy. Yeah. So for me to listen, like you know, when I watch Hamilton, like I'm, I was like, you're working like, hard. I, well, yeah, because I'm like, because I, I don't re- I don't have the reflex of hip hop. Like I like people who listen to hip hop. It, it's there's no. It's not an effort to understand what's happening, you know, or follow it. But for me, just to pay attention right. to something other than beat and and melody is sort of like, oh, I got to work, yeah. you know. And you know, like, I felt like an old person at that <laughs> show. Like, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, like people my mother's age going like, it was hard to follow because <laughs> you got to listen, you got to listen, and you got to follow the rhythms, and and they're not ingrained in me. Not be, I mean, I I like hip hop, but it was not what yeah. I was brought up with. Right. No, I, I feel that way when I go see Shakespeare. I, even if it's I a can't play, do Shakespeare. But even if it's a play, I've seen like yeah. I've seen. Macbeth maybe 50 times yeah. and you go and it starts and you go oh shit I forgot how to listen to Shakespeare <laughs> like I'm, I'm in a panic the first 10 minutes and then your brain clicks into it like there is a rhythm to the speech and the 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 pentameter that yeah. you, then you you go okay no I I'm with it. Yeah. It took me a second to orient myself and I'm with it. And I think the same thing happens with Hamilton. I think you No, definitely. You 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 go like this and you clench up like oh they're are they going to be talking this fast all night and then right. you you get you know but Leonard also, Cohen, then she gets you on your wavelength. That's right, and then you you walk into the wavelength. But also, you're dealing with, you, you know, the interaction. There there are you know, there are people interacting, you yeah. know, and talking, yeah. you know, in, in this rhythm. So you know that engagement, yeah, where it's not just coming at you, you know, forces you to feel the emotion of it, and then that locks you in also on a deeper level. Yeah, that everybody sort of and the songs are pretty. Yes. <laughs> So I also, I know, I loved, um, so I love musicals, but, you know, if you're a Puerto Rican dude, here are your options. Bernardo in West Side Story, Paul, the, the Puerto Rican dancer in Chorus Line, who gets one big monologue, and that's about it. And I didn't dance, and so I was just like, I don't see how I can have a life in this. But uh, also, what, what was the reaction on the street? What do you mean? Oh, in my neighborhood? Yeah. Oh, I mean, that was, it was, you know, it's funny. I, I got into my school when I was five. So uh-huh. I, it, I had which this, school? Uh, I went to Hunter, which is like this magnet school on the Upper East Side. Right. You have to take three IQ tests to get in. And I right. got in in kindergarten. Right. So I had the conversation, are you Lin or Lin Manuel when I was five years old? You know what I mean? I go from speaking Spanish at home to speaking English at school. And that, 
in a way, I'm really grateful for it because I sort of learned how to talk to very different types of people at a super young age. You know, right. A lot of kids, when they grow up in my neighborhood and then suddenly they're in college and they go, holy shit, there's no one like me. Like, what the fuck am I doing here? Yeah. I, I had that happen when I was six years old. So I, I, so you were in college at that age? I don't understand. So no, no, you no, got I, in. No, the, got school's, test. the school's called Hunter College Elementary School. It's, okay, it's okay. at a CUNY. I got it. Um, and so it's sort of a, it's a public school, but it's a, it's a gifted school. School. Right. Um, quote unquote gifted school. And that was something that your parents were like, we're going to try to get him in here. Yeah, I had a really rough time in nursery school. They're like, we got to get him, you know, you know, we can't afford private school. Right. <laughs> like, he's got to be smart enough to get into this motherfucker. All right. So you were able to cross that, that cultural, uh, boundary at a very young age and it became adept. You became sort of, it was second nature to you to deal yeah. with the two worlds. But like, as yeah, you- but I, I had my friends in the neighborhood who went to school locally and then I had my friends who lived on the Upper East Side. And Did you ever get West shit side. for being a musical guy? Uh, in the neighborhood? I got shit from being a musical guy everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of it. Um, you know, I've, I had the advantage of uh, my great uncle in Puerto Rico was an actor. He was a really famous actor on the island, actually. He started the, his name is Ernesto Concepcion. So my Latino side of the family, who they're normally the ones who give you shit, like, what, right. acting? What, right. are you acting? Right. Um, they they got it, because we had a family member who was actually, actually made a living at it. Um, so in it Puerto wasn't Rico. quite st- as stigmatized as it might be in other families. Yeah, I made a living in Puerto Rico, and his, uh, his son is, is still, is a really talented actor uh, on the island, too. How much time did you spend in Puerto Rico? Every summer. So, I, and that was the other thing I got. So, I'm, I'm switching between the Upper East Side and 200th Street. And then every summer, I get sent to this tiny town, uh, Vega Alta, Puerto Rico, population, I think it's like 70,000 now. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, where my Spanish is so shitty uh, that, like, kids <laughs> my age just, I start to engage and they go, like, you talk weird. We're going over here. So, all my friends in Puerto Rico were my grandparents' friends. Like, I'm, like... I, I'm still close with all the little old ladies who survive, uh, who are over there. Yeah. And I was hanging out with them and watching He-Man in Spanish and watching fucking Fl- <laughs> Flintstones in Spanish, which is called Las Pica Piedras, um, <laughs> which means the stone cutters. Um, and so... So you feel very connected to it. Yeah, I feel very connected to it because um, I, I, I... And I'm grateful for that, too, because it was uh, it was most... I think a lot of kids whose parents come from somewhere else really feel a disconnect from their ancestral place of origin. And I, I don't. Like, I had summers there. I ate the food. I, you know, I worked. I had a part-time job, like, in Puerto Rico. And so that was, uh, you know, that that's also a part of... Is your home bilingual now? Yeah. 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 My, my, my wife uh, grew up in Washington Heights, too. And uh, she's an even crazier mix. She's Dominican-Austrian. Hmm. Um, her dad grew up in the city. Like, her her dad was like... I think of him as like a character in the Bronx tale. Like he grew up when it was like black block, Puerto Rican block, like, and it was turf. Um, he had a do up group. Like it's like yeah, yeah. that level of that <laughs> New York in the, you know, yeah, yeah. in Washington Heights. And then her, uh, her mom's Austrian, like came here, uh, as a teenager. Um, and so, um, she grew up speaking Spanish. She got sent to DR every summer. She was sent to the Dominican Republic. So she also had the weird, like, I have this connection to my island, but yeah. I go to Hunter and I live on 184th Street. Right. And so, uh, so when we met, we went to the same high school, didn't know each other in high school. Huh. Um, we were two years apart. Um, I always, <laughs> she's, she's very, uh, much more logical than me. I always say, yeah, she was two years younger than me. And she goes, I'm still two years younger than you. Stop saying it in the past. It's, <laughs> it's going to be that way for all of it. Yeah. Exactly. It's going to stick that way. Yeah. But then we, we re-met in our mid twenties and it was one of those like, oh, we had the same experience and didn't know each other while we were living through it. And you have one kid or two? We have one kid. He turned two, yeah. He and he, tur- sp- he speaks Spanish at home? Yeah, he speaks Spanish and uh, English and a smattering of Austrian German thanks to his, his <laughs> Oma, to his grandma. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild, dude. All right, so, okay, so you go to the Hunter, co- the Hunter School. Yeah. And you, as you said earlier, at this time, uh, hip hop was infusing the, the the neighborhood and also the you know the culture of of people your age yeah and that was really how you thought and 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 enjoyed popular music outside you had this musical 
uh, this weird ingrained in you, this musical yeah. passion. Yeah, and I always, I always just love music that told stories, and and so genre becomes fluid. Yeah, you know, it's, right. You know, <laughs> and you know, this sounds crazy, but um, a huge help in that was fucking Weird Al Yankovic. Oh yeah, yeah. Like I was a little kid, and when you listen to Weird Al Yankovic, you realize that genre is just the clothes the artist puts on and right. the orchestration. Like he'll do a polka version of fucking Hot Rocks. Right. And you're like, oh, it's the same chord progression, it's the same melody, uh, it's just played on an accordion, and oh. suddenly it's a polka. Interesting. So through his parody, through his you were par- able to to sort of deconstruct the structure of any sort of song. Yeah, and that- you, and you realize that like, oh, my hip hop friends are alienating my musical friends, but like, we just like music that tells stories. One of the first rap songs I memorized, I had a great bus driver the the you know we had to take a separate bus that took us into school because i lived so far from school um and our bus driver i think wanted to be a rapper and never it, it never happened yeah. it was his name was billy baker jr and he would do he would rap to us all the way to school uh-huh. he would do uh krs1 raps and he would do he made us memorize uh rapper's delight and one of the ones he did that i memorized that he made us memorize this is in my 40 minute ride to and from school was called beef by Boogie Down Productions, a.k.a. KRS One, and it was all about being a vegetarian. And uh, I, to the, I, did, I never heard the actual song until I was an adult. I only heard my bus driver's rendition, but it was <laughs> beef. What a relief. When will this poisonous product cease? <laughs> this is another public service announcement. You can believe it or you can doubt it. Let us begin now with the cow. The way it gets to your plate and how. The cow doesn't grow fast enough for man, so he has drugs to make a quicker plan. He has drugs to make the cow grow quicker. Through the stress, the cow gets sicker. 21 different drugs are pumped into the cow with one big lump. Just before it dies, it cries in the slaughterhouse. <laughs> like, and then he starts going on about Elijah Muhammad, and like, it's like, we learned this like radical, like, don't eat pork, don't eat meat song. From your bus driver. On our way to third grade. <laughs> you love that guy. Love that guy. So grateful for that guy. What happened to that guy? He's still around, because yeah. transportation, I still, it still drives around my neighborhood. <laughs> I'm still taking kids to school. I still live up there. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That, that, like, you know, one guy like that, not even a teacher. Not a teacher. The like, guy driving the bus the guy, was, he, they're sometimes the coolest people. You gotta see him every day. He's got limited time with you, yeah. but he can put on his own show. He puts on his own show. And we learned mind playing tricks. I mean, I, I mean, I really got a hip hop. Did he get the whole bus me. singing? Yeah, he'd get us all singing. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? Thank God for that guy. Thank God for that guy. So, so hip hop and storytelling is, is coming in on the bus. I'm listening to musicals at home. I'm getting cast in the school play. And then. Did I, you do any stuff at school? Yeah, yeah. You What'd know, you do? I did my, my sh- you know, th- this is the musical theater version of Who Are Your Guys? Yeah. Who are is. your guys? Who are you guys? <laughs> Eighth grade, I played the Pirate King in Pirates of Penzance. Oh, uh, no, sorry, that's ninth grade. And that's a big deal. To get a big role when you're a freshman, uh, that's like everything, right? Yeah. You know, that's, so that was, I'd arrived. Um, and then tenth grade, I was Judas and Godspell. Um, eleventh grade, I was the assistant director for Chorus Line. My yeah. girlfriend was the director. Yeah. Uh, and then senior year, I directed West Side Story. Really? Yeah. Did you now? We're at, at that time, so this is high school. Yeah. And this is a gifted school. So yeah, I'm so, one of five Puerto Ricans in the school. W- right. <laughs> but also, are you learning? Like, I imagine you're learning. You know, the necessity of of. Of, of lights, of choreography. Yeah. Of, and it was you know, also, you, yeah, the other blessing was it was a student run show. It right. wasn't like a faculty directed show. So you had to sort of get into that, the, the, the collaborative nature of theater. Yeah. And you learn, I mean, I think the life skills you learn on that you take with you the rest of your life because you can't hire or fire anyone. <laughs> you yeah. have no sway over your fellow students other than get them excited about making something, you know, there's no grade for this. It's extracurricular. But there's no tangible benefit. So you just have to learn how to inspire other people and work with other people. Um, and, and, you know, that was immeasurably like. And you're I, a kid. And you're a kid. And you're a kid. And you're like, we're going to have a secret rehearsal on spring break, even though, because we need it. We have to. Because yeah. we have to. Uh, even though it's not, you know, one of our mandated rehearsals. And you, you learn how to just. And then there's the kid who's like, no, I'm going on vacation. You go, well, 
and you can't fire them. Right. <laughs> you can't say fuck you. You go. Well, we'll make do without you. Yeah, but we'll, we'll yeah. figure it out. Um, right. And so you you really learn a lot of how to get people inspired and get people going without anything other than the idea itself. But let me ask you. I mean, like you know, there a collaboration is a collaboration. You you may uh, acknowledge you know differences and uniquenesses and different in backgrounds and stuff. But did you ever feel the weight of it of um, being one of five Puerto uh, Ricans in that school? Yeah, you feel the weight of it. I mean, that's the, uh, and it's, and I didn't even realize I felt, because I got there at such a young age, yeah. I didn't realize it until I went to college and made friends with other Latino kids who had that experience. Yeah. You know, I lived in a house, uh, a Latino program house my sophomore year at Wesleyan. It was called La Casa. Uh-huh. You had to write an essay to get in. <laughs> uh, and suddenly, suddenly my friends, like, also were first generation, and, and, and I didn't realize how much of myself I was leaving at home. Mm-hmm. Um, you oh, know, really? when I went to high school, uh-huh. you know, I loved being in theater and I, I, my, my friends from high school, I'm still in touch with them, I'm still close with, but then I got to school and I was like, oh, like I can share jokes with these guys that I never would have brought to school. Right. You know, it's like a, an entirely different level. And that's when I started writing in the Heights. It was when I realized, oh, my experience in Puerto Rico, my experience in my neighborhood, that's fair game for me to write about. Right. Um, and, and, you know, when you bring all of yourself into a room, not just the part that is useful for the person you're talking to, mm-hmm. which is something I learned to do very well yeah. in, in school, unconsciously. Right. You know, unconsciously you go, no, just call me Lynn because I can't right. <laughs> deal right. with yes. manual. Manual. You know, what uh, I did. Yeah. Uh, for, to, just to call back the beginning of the show, uh, <laughs> but, Mark Marin said Lynn Manual. But you learn. Manuel. 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 But we, you know, you, I learned at a very young age how to just make people comfortable. And I learned to adapt at such a young age that, um, I, I didn't realize the power of bringing all of myself into a room but until also, but, much later. But that's interesting though, because adapting is the beginning of collaborating on some level. Absolutely. In, in terms of, of, of your creative growth. Yeah. That, you know, you knew who you were, you weren't ashamed of it, but you innately adapted to the, the cultural Yeah, I talked about were... the things that we can talk about. Right. What was on TV last and night. And then at some point you realize, like, I can celebrate the things that are different. Yeah, and I can bring you something you maybe don't know about. There you go. You know, that's that's what In the Heights was the beginning of. It was, oh, I'm going to take the Latin music I grew up with, and I'm going to play with that in these songs. Because I was writing musicals already in high school. And there's no fuck you to that. There's celebration to that. Correct. There's yeah, it's di- Correct. Yeah, and there's no way to interpret it as fuck you. Yeah. Unless you're sick. <laughs> yeah, unless you're sick. <laughs> unless, unless you literally see something different as a threat. Right. But, so, now, they, what other stuff, did, when did you start, you started, you know, conceiving the, in the heights, in high school, but. In college. In college. college. Yeah. But in high school, did you do any original work? Yeah, I started, I wrote one act musicals, uh, in high school. Uh huh. Um, I wrote one my junior year. Actually, did I tell you this? I think I told you this when we first met after the show. Backstage, it was all very uh, it was all a, a blur. adrenaline. The yeah. guy who directed my first musical is a 15-minute musical called Nightmare and Demajor. Yeah. Chris Hayes. Yeah, Chris Hayes. Chris Hayes. Political commentator. Grew Chris, up in the Chris Bronx. Hayes. We took the bus home together. Yeah. Um, and we were really good friends. He was a year older than me. I and know. He, I had him in here. He want, he's still... He, there's a... a he has a fantasy of returning to theater, you know. Well, he played Zach in a chorus line. <laughs> and he was fucking great. Um, and he was a really great dramatic actor. He's a sweet guy. A sweet guy. And directed my first musical. Um, my grandmother used to call Chris El Mexicano because he was the only one of my friends who, when he would come over, would speak Spanish to my grandmother. Uh, cause he, you know, he would always work in summer jobs and he, he spoke Spanish pretty fluently for a white dude. And, um, and so she would always say, Donde está el mexicano? Where's the Mexican? And the Mexican was Chris Hayes. <laughs> That's so, it's, it, it's, it's cute and it's, it's, it's moving, you know, because there is, a, there was, um, that working class, civic minded. Yes. Uh, family that you both came from. Yeah, that's right. That, that you, you know, that you, you weren't, there wasn't this sort of, you know, gunning for the prize, which I, I think, you know, we all do innately, but we'd like it to be true to ourselves. I think that's somewhat, somewhat of what that first musical is about, right? Uh, yeah. Well, in the heights, sure. Yeah. Um, Nightmare in D Major, on the other no, hand, no. was like about a fetal pig from AP Bio coming back for revenge. <laughs> That's the one he directed? That's the one he directed. And that was a musical? That was a musical. So was that a, a Little Shop of Horrors kind Yeah, of? it was like all this weird dream, right? Okay. So it was, you know, it, yeah. was, it was, there was a lost love, and then there was this fetal pig. It was so fucking bad. It was like, I'm just a fetal pig. I'm not very big, so why did you cut me up in bio class? And she comes back with a knife and threatens him, and then she dredges up all the monsters from his subconscious to uh-huh. fight him. Like, here's your alcoholic <laughs> Uncle Steve. <laughs> like, here's your fifth grade nurse, you know? 
know, it's it was like a really crazy Sounds deep, though. Show. Yeah, it was. I mean, for me, for 16, it was pretty deep. And then my senior year, I wrote a musical called Seven Minutes in Heaven, because write what you know. So I wrote a musical about the first unchaperoned party I went to in seventh grade, where half the kids are, like, ready to make out and, like, do all the shit. Yeah. And half the kids are like, I thought we were watching Disney Afternoon right. and, like, still kids. So, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you're on that weird nexus. Right. Um, and that's, what, like, one of the first songs I wrote that I'm really proud of there was a this little girl who sings you know in sixth grade everything was very clear you guys go play we're fine right over here but suddenly we're interested in what they have to say they're just as stupid as they were last year like she's the girl who's like why are we fucking with boys right now <laughs> like we were all fine on our side of the line and now all my friends are obsessed with making out with those idiots that we were just playing with yeah which is kind of how i felt like lurching into middle school like well wait, are we doing this are we like racing to second second base and third base and who's gotten to second base already? Right, right. Is that a thing? Have yeah. I, am I behind the curve? And on what exactly shit? do you do at third base? Yeah, I, I, I <laughs> never understood third base. I didn't understand third base until I was past it. <laughs> to quote chorus line. <laughs> Is that a chorus line line? It was, uh, I didn't know what a puberty was until I was almost past it. Yeah, that's a chorus. That's they, a chorus I like line the more line. specific version. Yeah, but it's easier to put this the- in there than it is to figure out how to work it. Yeah, yeah. I, I get Frenching, I get Getting yeah. under the shirt. I don't know what happens after that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, in between third. There's fluids it, involved. Yeah. In between second and, and home plate. That, that's a world a, of mystery. Well, you got well, you got to ask questions. <laughs> and you know, that's at right. that age, you're not going to be asking questions. That's right. And they're not, and they're not going to volunteer you the information to you quite yeah. yet. That's right. <laughs> they that's will right. eventually. Oh man. Did you ever consider doing straight Hip hop? I mean, yeah, not in terms of musical, but like pursuing a career as a as a rapper or hip hop artist. I, I mean, think, you ended up being a hip hop artist, but yeah. But I think if if I, if I had been around that more in my day to day school life, I think that's probably the direction I would have gone in. We had one really great uh, hip hop group in our school, and um, and I sort of worship those guys. They had a band called Dugis. They're still around. And, they uh, were a group. They, they were like a, a, they, a yeah. Troop, they, were, they were like a, they, were, they were like a roots type yeah, yeah. band. Like oh, they yeah. were a band, and they had MCs, and and they were great. And all I ever wanted to do was I was in Pirates of Penzance with the main MC from his name is Lauren Hammonds. He's a great guy, mm-hmm. and I would sheepishly be like, I wrote this rap. Do you think it's any good? Like because he was yeah. he was already a senior, and he was such a gift. He's such a gifted MC. Yeah. Um. So, but but then I I never got any encouragement in that direction. Yeah. Uh, so I just sort of. You know, it just sort of bled into the, the the musicals I was writing. So when you go to college, you went to where, Wesleyan? Wesleyan. You said Wesleyan. Yeah, in Connecticut. Connecticut. So that's a big shift. That's a big shift. But for a New Yorker, too. I passed my driver's test the day before I went to school. Because, you know, when you grow up in New York, like, who the fuck needs to drive? It's a lot of people. It's very interesting to me. Yeah. yeah. Anyone who grew up in a city with good public transportation, you're like, yeah. I don't fucking need to do that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. you the 20s. But I had the, I had the luxury of my sister had a hand-me-down car that she wasn't using because she lived in the city yeah and they were like well you can have a beat-up saturn like if you pass the test so i passed the test the day before basically learned to drive at school and, and when you packed up your car that was your first big trip yeah, my first time on the on fucking the highway up. was it <laughs> yeah on 95 fucking hands at 10 into shaking it's actually easier yeah i mean you can relax a little bit yeah a little i bit. used to love driving in the city when i had my car there when i was running up and down the fdr at you know one in the morning to do comedy spots it was exciting yeah to drive in the city to catch that run of lights where you're like i'm going all the way downtown on this run of green lights my version of that is catching the two three at 96th street and getting like 70 second 40 it's the closest thing we have to time travel right <laughs> i was like oh i thought it was gonna take a half an hour fuck there's a two train yes, yes. boom <laughs> yep beautiful yeah i i, I still I, I took the subway to carnegie hall the other day it was great I, how many times did you take the subway to to the theater to do hamilton oh i mean all, all the time all, all right? the time all the time it was a bitch at the public yeah because that's you know i Couple live trains. i live yeah. yeah it's the a and then there's no real good way to go east you know in new york math it's harder to go east than it is to go north south <laughs> right so you, okay so you get to college and you start you were now in the arts program yeah, I, I, I was. I was a. Uh, I, I wanted to be a double major in theater and film, mm-hmm. uh, and then just like in high school, theater ended up taking up all my time. So yeah. I did my core requirements for film, and then never pursued it, and uh, just started. I was. I was writing and acting in shows in in equal measure. And there's no musical theater major at Wesleyan. Um, it's it's very avant garde. It, it's very viewpoints. It's very like what like what was being taught. 
Oh, well, you get taught the canon, right? You get your Tennessee Williams and uh-huh. you get your, you know, Three Penny Opera and, and, and Brecht and, and, and you get all that good foundational stuff. But the stuff people are putting up is, is very, um, it's, esoteric. It's, lazy. it's esoteric. Yeah. It's, I was in a play, um, by Maria Irene Fornis, uh, called Molly's Dream. It was the first play I got at Wesleyan and it's like a super out there play where it's, I'm a guy who's dressed as a cowboy and five women are, are all like hanging on to me and I have no idea why. <laughs> like, yeah. I did not understand the symbolism of the play I was in. Um, and so I'm also trying, but I'm also trying to make like musical theater happen, which is very odd at Wesleyan. And there were, no one was putting up musicals. They were, but all extracurricular. It wasn't a thing that the, Actual theater department focused on and, and, and sort of was, like sort of like in high school that that you know you had or like or where I went to college you had a stage troupe that would either do a play or they do a musical but you didn't see many musicals from the theater school yeah yeah exactly that's right and so I kind of uh, supplemented that because I knew what I wanted yeah. so I would go you know I'd take voice lessons and I took piano lessons outside and, of school or in uh, school? no it, within the music department okay and then. Found a great professor who saw in the Heights when I put it up at Wesleyan and did a tutorial with me. Um, so I got like a semester of credit just doing a private musical theater tutorial. He took a liking to you and mentored you. He said, this kid's got something yes. and, you know, this is not something we see here, but it's valid. Absolutely. And who was that guy? A Bill Francisco, who is a legend at Wesleyan, was one of the legendary, super eccentric, um, super brilliant uh, theater directors. And we, uh, my class got him in it. He, he retired our year. Uh-huh. So we were sort of got the last of his brilliance and strangeness. And in dealing with him, I learned to navigate every mood because he had a lot of them. And some days it was, um, you're brilliant and this is wonderful. And one day I remember being in a rehearsal and there was a love scene in the show I was writing. And he said, are we all sitting here because Lynn can't get laid? Like, is that what the fuck we're sitting here paid uh, to watch? I can't deal with this and walk out. And like, it was, I never knew which bill I was going to get from day hurt. to day. Uh, yeah, it, <laughs> on many levels. <laughs> so again, the, the adapting kid is put to the test. Put to the test <laughs> by a brilliant, um, but also very moody, uh, genius. So when you score, you, you, you know, cause I, like, the, I have musical in me. I I uh, I, sh- I stuff it down. <laughs> you push it down. I push it down. But like a lot of times, I find myself like there's It's very in, you know, sort of like nicotine lozenges. Yeah, you make up the song. <laughs> it's it is an. Er- I'm it here is- with my thermos again. <laughs> you get beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. But that instinct is 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 just the instinct that you nurture when you're when you write musicals. It's the. When do we break into song? <laughs> right, but there's like, but you can, like, I don't go to many musicals, but I know, like, that, like, you know, if I go, there's my thermos, I put. But why are you singing in. like that? Like, like, that's the thing. <laughs> no, I know, but because I'm not, I didn't, I didn't take it to the next I, level. That's your job. What I'm saying is I know just after that, that I can go, like, there's my thermos with coffee. And how will I drink it? When am I going to drink it? Thermos, thermos. You know, I, I, you know, like I could feel. Oh, you went to Funikali Funukala. <laughs> I could. <laughs> thermos, <laughs> thermos. Dun, 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 dun. Funikali Funikala. That works. Yeah, it works. But it's so funny when you think musical. Suddenly, it's I gotta sing like this. And but there's a little of that in there. I don't care if it's hip hop or not. <laughs> there's, of course, there is. <laughs> You've got to do that. Yeah, but for me, the my favorite musicals are where you have that and you have that layer of artifice that we're breaking into song. But then it also feels real. It also you have those moments that feel conversational, and those are also my favorite moments in hip hop. I too. think that's the tricky thing. Yeah, I mean that you y- you know to. To have a story that isn't rendered ridiculous. Correct. By, by the, the nature of the, of the mode. Yeah. And the best songwriters can do that. They can, they can make heightened speech feel like something we'd say in our real lives. Uh-huh. Whether it's Sondheim, you know, with a little priest from Sweeney Todd, with them singing, you know, how about priest? Try little priest, you know, and it just feels like they're talking, but it's this incredibly elaborate rhyme scheme. And, and also, like you, just by what you just did there, you know, I realized that you know, with the benefit of song, you can you can really talk about heavy shit Absolutely. and deliver it in a way that it is it's like lubricated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and yeah, all of a sudden you don't realize until it hits your heart. 
you, sneak, you know what's happened. Totally. You sneak it in. You absolutely sneak in whatever you like. You know, the one of the biggest showstoppers in Hamilton is this song called The Room Where It Happens, where it's from the perspective of a guy who's not at a meeting, but then the shit he's saying, I, I mean, and you're seeing dancing and you're seeing this incredible stagecraft and incredible orchestrations by Alex Lacamoire, but... You know, the the lyrics are the art of the compromise. Hold your nose and close your eyes. You know, we, we want our leaders to save the day, but we don't get a say in what they trade away. We dream of a brand new start, but we dream in the dark for the most part. Wow, it's so irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, you're writing from a historical context, but politics has not changed. Not a bit. Not a fucking bit. It's fucking fascinating. Yeah. So now, okay, so you do this personal story about your neighborhood you know, that, that, that is, you know, it's your first musical and it gets a lot of attention. Yeah. And now when you do, when you do orchestrations, do you write music? Yeah, I write, so the way I work is I, I play piano. I'm a pretty shitty pianist, but I can play just well enough to write my songs. And you can read music. And I can read music. And that becomes part of the process too. Like if a, if a melody can survive my chops. Yeah. Then it's catchy enough to, to survive. You know what I mean? Like, like a it's, jingle. It's, yeah, it's gotta, it's gotta survive like my, fruitlessly getting it wrong until I've got what's in my head down on paper. Uh-huh. Um, and what, what I, my way of working, I think the fastest way to work is I'll make a big, you know, Heights was written in GarageBand and Hamilton was written in Logic. We're writing it. We're, we're in GarageBand now. Yeah. Me and you. Yeah. We exist in GarageBand. Yeah. Hopefully. All of In the Heights got written in GarageBand. And then I, I send these files with rudimentary arrangements. I played the bass part. I played the guitar part. I played the piano. And I, you know, send it to Alex Lacamoire, who then orchestrates it. He assigns, uh, you know, he adds all these colors in the way he assigns, uh, the, the music to different, uh, Parts and, and what's he, his job title? He's uh, the music director and he's co-orchestrator. Uh, he's the orchestrator and arranger. Okay, for my work. And and um, you're, you're the the guy you've worked with forever, uh, Thomas. Tommy Kale, yeah. You worked with him on in college. Uh, no, we met the week after I graduated college, but he directed In the Heights. Um, we went to the same school. But, and, and who co-wrote In the Heights with you? Uh, Kiara, Kiara Hudy. She came along in 2004 um, when I realized I, I can't do all three of these jobs. And, you know, I was I was writing the whole thing then, and uh, I didn't want to let go of music or lyrics, but I was happy to let go of sort of libretto duty. Yeah. Uh, and she was, uh, it was like heaven. What exactly sent. is the libretto? That's the story? That's the story. That's yeah. the dialogue. That's the structure. Um, you know, it's sort of the unsung art form in musicals. Right. If, the, the, the running joke is, you know, if, uh, if a musical, uh, succeeds, you don't notice the book writer at all. If a musical fails, the book writer, it's the book writer's fault. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, Chiara wrote an amazing libretto for us. And she grew up in North Philly. So she understood sort of that immigrant neighborhood at changing, uh, in a very, in the same visceral way that I did. Um, and first in her family to go to college. And so she really like got those characters. And, you know, she was working from an existing show that I wrote in college. And then we sort of ripped it up and wrote it from scratch when, when she came on board. Wow. Yeah. She's and, incredible. And that did well for you? Did well. Like, uh, to me, that was the pinnacle of how well a musical could do. Like, we won Best Musical. We ran three years. We had a touring company. And you're acting for the first time? And I was, and, and I was acting. I was, you know, I got out of the bellhop outfit and got to play a leading role in a, in a musical. And I wrote my own sort of opportunity in that way. Yeah. I know that. I, I, I know that feeling. Yes. And, but you had not been hitting the boards too long with the auditions and stuff. I mean, you were always working on the musical, right? I, mean, I was always working on the musical. I was substitute teaching to, to pay my but rent. But you weren't like going out on auditions every other day, were you? Um, no, not really, but I, I did. I mean, yeah. I went on voiceover auditions. Sure. I went and, you know, I didn't, it, I didn't have an agent for a really long time. Right. So you yeah. got one now though, right? I got one now. <laughs> yeah. But Heights was, Heights was my calling card in a, in a pretty big way. And that's, and that, and that, uh, that solidified you. Yeah. Your talent and also your world. That, like, you know, not unlike your father's entrance into politics, they were like, all right, we've got a, a, a Latino guy yeah. that, that's, that, that speaks the language of, of art and love and, and music and everything else and, and he can do it for a, ma- a mainstream audience. Yeah. And I think, I think what people recognize in that show, both traditional musical theater fans and, and people who want something new out of their musicals was, um, these guys love musicals. You know, there's a lot of people who sort of try to write shows for Broadway and we go, we hate musicals. That's why we wrote one. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they get met with indifference by the community and 
in the Heights is such a love letter to the music, to Fiddler, to fucking, I mean, everything I grew up loving in the same way Hamilton is. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't want to burn it down and start from scratch. I wanted to write my version of a musical. Right. But there was also some precedent. I, I mean, there was a, you know, like I remember when I was a kid, you know, going to see the, the, the black cast of, uh, Guys and Dolls. Yeah. You know, and, you know, bringing the funk, bringing the noise and yeah, some bring, of the stuff. Yeah, that, that came out the same year as Rent, and that was a watershed year. I mean, that was nice. And Kushner's musical I saw. Yeah, uh, Carolina Change. Which I thought was tremendous. Incredible musical. And, and, uh, what else? Like, cause I just talked to George Wolf, and when I was there to see Hamilton. George Wolf is amazing. He's great. And I went to see Shuffle Along. And there, there are such sim- an incredible show. It was a great show. Yeah. And there are similar themes. Absolutely. Who and, gets and, to tell your story? Yeah. And, and, and maybe one of the greatest companies we'll ever see. Like, like in of, Shuffle Along? In Shuffle Along. It was astounding. I, it's, it's, um, it's crazy. It's not still running. It is a little crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Now, uh, but see, like that's, but that's an interesting question because, you, you know, Hamilton is now going to run until, you know, your kid can play the lead. <laughs> so. <laughs> Most likely. It's never going to go away. They're, they're going to rename the theater. It's like the Lion King did. You know what I mean? <laughs> like this is going to be the Hamilton Theater. That's fine. Congratulations. But the, but the interesting thing about Shuffle Along, it's a specifically black experience. Yes. And, and, and it's, it's about a story that isn't told. It isn't told and is, and is black history. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a uh, black history that was sort of, um, passed over by the black community and also by the show business community, by, obviously by the white community. And he, he resurrected something that was a missing chunk of the history of show business and the history of the black experience in America. Why isn't that show running? I'm, I'm genuinely sort of asking myself the question. I think what happened with Shuffle Long is a lot, in a lot of ways, what happened within, in the Heights. Um, there are things that we just have cultural baggage about. Yeah. Uh, we can't help but have it. Some people will hear hip hop and that is a barrier to entry for them. They right. think that's not for me. I'm not going to, and, and Broadway's fucking expensive. Right. So they think that's not for me. I'm not going. You know, In the Heights won all the things it could win and yet by the standards of the stuff, the success it had, didn't yeah. run very long right. because hip hop, Latin musical, that's a lot of cultural barriers for the people who can afford Broadway tickets. Right. And I think a similar thing happened, uh, with, with Shuffle Long. It right. was, um, this African American history and, and, you know, there's no barrier to entry there. You know, some of the greatest musicals, sure. you think of The Wiz, you think of Porgy and Bess, you think of, there's such an incredible, uh, history of African American musicals written by African Americans, starring African Americans. Um, but, um, for whatever reason, um, they, it didn't get out of, it, 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 something was a barrier to entry for, for people. And I, and I don't know what that was. Yeah, but I, and, think and that I, was, that was true of In the Heights too, of people being like, yeah, not for me. They just, I, they heard the general, they heard the elevator pitch and they're like, not for me. Yeah, but, uh, but I think also that, y- you know, working people, you know, do get priced out. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and Absolutely. that's, it's so fucking expensive to, to mount the show. And how, how do you sort of like, cause I know you guys did your, you did take action to sort of make the production more available, didn't you? Uh, yeah. To, I mean, the, the biggest priority we had was, was kids have to be able to see the show. It, right. it, it's, it's useless to put on Hamilton and not have the kids who are studying this shit not have access to it. So we developed a program where 20,000 school kids are seeing Hamilton every, uh, every year, um, and that's going to continue with the touring productions. Like in every every city, the show will go to. We will partner with the chap the Title One schools um, and get the kids who are studying that into the theater. Um, you know, we can't solve the problem of supply and demand. Um, you know, the, the the magic of theater is that you're in the room with the thing. And I don't know how to solve. 1300 people, you know, that's how much we have room for. Right, but also your, you know, the, the soundtrack is available at a reasonable yeah. price. And the soundtrack and is the whole show. Yeah, and it's, it's a sung through show. Yeah. So you get the entire plot and, and everything. And, and then you're giving kids that experience that you had. Yeah, it's, it's exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's how you experience musical theater. You, yeah. You know, and, and yeah, cause we didn't see many shows. We just, I, I just fell in love with well, when, albums. when does this, like, and we're going to get back to you buying that book in a second, but when, when does this, like when does it uh, is it available for can high schools do it not yet right um there's sort of the, the life of a of a show is uh if you're lucky enough to get to broadway um and it does a little well you do a tour and more people can see that production that's the same footprint and the same uh everyone's involved like tommy and i are putting yeah. up those tours we're casting those tours mm-hmm. um some shows get the luxury of a uk uh 
production. We're getting that with Hamilton. We didn't get that on In the Heights. Just, there was no one interested in mounting that In the Heights. There's a production there that's doing well now, but it's not our production. Because um, that's been freed. Because that's okay, been freed. And then, yeah. To the royalty after system. Those, after those run their, their, their lifespan, you go to Stock and Amateur. Um, and that is. And that's where you buy the books at. Who puts out those books? That's right. It's either yeah. MTI or, or R&H. Uh, or Tam's Whitmark. Or French's. French's. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah so yeah. those are the f- big four, uh, in Stock and Amateur land. Sure. And that's when school productions happen and regional productions happen. And you have some level of... of, of uh, but that's just part of the arc of the life of a show. That's that, the yeah. arc of a life of a show. Yeah, right. yeah, it's like the way TV shows go from first run to rerun to syndication. Sure. We go Broadway to tour to... Stuff now, why, why uh, are there plans to, to, to make a movie? Of Hamilton? Yeah. Uh, not for a while. I'm, I'm in no rush. You know, yeah. I, I, I really feel like... We work so hard to make a thing that works in the theater. Sure. I want people to see it in that form sure. first. Um, I don't want the movie, which will be an act of translation, if it's brilliant or if it's terrible. Um, well, you got you, you. You did study it a little bit. <laughs> I did study it a little bit. <laughs> um, it's, your but next, it, it's, your next, it's your next evolution. Yeah, I'd like. I'd like a, a, a. You know, there's there's the musicals that go straight to movie. Mm-hmm. You know, you have your. Uh, hairspray, or you have, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of other shows. And then you have the musicals that like take 30 years. Like Chicago open, the, the movie of Chicago, which I think is actually better than the show, even. Mm-hmm. I thought Rob Marshall did such an amazing job with that thing. Um, came out like 25 years after that show debuted. So. What was interesting to me, t- too, is that like in that, you know, five minute conversation when we met, yeah. Backstage with um, who, who's the guy with the shaved head? Uh, Chris Jackson, who plays George Washington. Right, who was great. Yeah, everyone was great. I was I was uh, honored to see the original cast. You know, like very quickly. You know, I'm I'm scrambling to connect with you to adapt to the world <laughs> of the backstage at the musical of the big musical star. But you know, we we locked in on this the the model, which you know I said you know I was nervous to say it, but I said it was like Jesus Christ Superstar. Yeah. But at, and you hit the nail on the head, by the way. Yeah. Because when I was reading that book, I thought, oh, this will be my Jesus Christ superstar. That's really what I thought when I started reading Hamilton's story was I could write songs. You know, my skill set of writing hip hop and R and B tunes fits this dude's life perfectly because this is a guy who needs words and needs uh, and sort of never shuts up. Um, the kind of music I write will. S- service his life really well and I'm going to make a concept album which was what Jesus Christ Superstar did it was a concept album first and then they figured out how to stage it later really yeah it was not it was not conceived as a show it was I, and that was a record album. my parents had and that was a record that I listened to as a kid yeah and because there, and when I saw the movie I was like what the fuck <laughs> but I, I, <laughs> well but, yeah I mean that movie too tricky, there's lots man. of yeah they all get it, in a bus and out to the desert right Norman Jewish and all these hippies they go out in a bus and then it you know it unfolds yeah. right I always but, think of the Mr. Show spoof of it too, which was so oh, I don't remember that. Right. Oh, but 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 the I don't know if I saw it. But but the the thing that like you know really kind of locked it in for me was you know two components was that you know Jesus Christ Superstar was narrated by Judas who was dead, <laughs> and you know and Aaron Burr who was definitely the under you know the 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 villain in a way of of your show he's the one that comes out and starts the story yeah. the one that killed the guy yeah. That's exactly right. And so, that's directly inspired by Jesus Christ. And then, like, you know, is it King George? Is, is that yeah. like the, like Herod song? He's totally which is, our Herod. <laughs> which, which, is, which is my favorite song. So if you are the Christ, you're oh, the great Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Prove to me that you're no fool. Walk across my swimming pool. Just do that for me. Like, I remember that. And then that was when, well sung, Mark. Thank Aaron. you. So then, we, so then, when George comes out and does his bit, I'm like, "This is it. This is it." Yeah, he's Herod, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, totally, totally. And I, and that was I'm that was the the fun of that. And and then you, as you're writing it, you realize so that's your inspiration. And then you go, okay, but this isn't actually Jesus Judas because it's not um, it's not follower who t- turns into enemy. And you, but I I look to the musical theater sort of predecessors. So is this Amadeus? Is this Mozart Salieri? Kind of. There's times when Burr is envious, but this is not a case of someone having genius and someone having not. They're both brilliant. Yeah. So it's actually, so as you're right, as I was writing, I realized this is a difference of temperament. This is a guy who is cautious versus a guy who is reckless. Right. And, um. Cautious in, in, in a, in a, in a surviving within this new structure. Like that he was cautious as a careerist. He was, he was a career, yeah. Career cautious. Yeah. And, uh, and this guy who 
in a lot of ways is very similar to him. Hamilton, they're both orphaned at a very but, young but age. But Hamilton's like, but a, a sort of a, a bipolar genius in a way. Yeah. Maybe not bipolar. I, I don't want to throw that word around, but, but he definitely can, had mania. I don't right. know about the other side of it, right. but there, but, but definitely had moments of so mania. When you start thinking about these elements, had you finished a book or is this happening? You, you buy this book in borders. You're looking for a, a book to read in Mexico. And I'm, I'm assuming projecting, and I can just ask you that, you know, you pick this book up and you couldn't put it down. Couldn't put it down. Couldn't put it down. Became my vacation. Was like, you know, this is nine, 2008. So, you know, my wife, then girlfriend, and I were, we're getting, we're at like an all inclusive resort. We're, we're drinking margaritas. I'm reading the book. We're watching season one of Mad Men on DVD. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And that was the vacation was just reading that book and being like, oh my God, the song the British sang was the world turned upside down. How fucking great. It's, it's just me circling shit that I think, you know, makes sense as in you're musical reading form it. as I'm reading it. So, so the first time knew. through. You know, what was it like right when you're reading the book where you're like, this is my guy. And uh, this is my protagonist. This when my- he wrote his way out of the Caribbean. When he literally wrote, there's a, there's a hurricane that destroys St. Croix. He's living in St. Croix. He's a teenager, but he's running this trading company. He's doing the books for this trading company. And this hurricane destroys the island. And he writes an essay about it. And the essay is so flowery and beautifully written that it gets published in the Danish American Gazette, uh, in, in an effort to get relief efforts for the island. And people take up a collection to send him to the colonies to get his education. They say, Go, go, become a doctor, come back, because um, you're too smart to be here. And to me, I was like, well, that's the most hip-hop shit I've heard. He literally writes his way out of um, his circumstances. Right. And I had that notion, and then the book sort of kept proving me right. The fact that he wrote under a pseudonym when he was writing against the British crown, like, oh, MCs, like, writing under pseudonyms. Like, th- just right. like every piece of hip-hop culture that I respond to had some reflection within his life in some way or another. And at that time, when did the conceptualization to make it, you know, about New York in a way? And, and, and then also to, to, to not, to, to honor the idea that these characters, although historical characters, are fluid ethnically. Yeah, well, I mean, that came with that initial inspiration. So the first time I'm reading the book, I'm not picturing the literal founders anymore. I'm picturing, okay, Hamilton's a mix of big pun, biggie, uh, Pac and Eminem. Um, that's who he is yeah. in, in the conception of how he's gonna, rap and how he's going to sing, uh, you get to George Washington and you go, okay, this guy's all moral authority. Uh, okay, so he's common. He's John Legend. He's those guys who just project this innate goodness and majesty. <laughs> so I'm dreaming, you know, I read the name Hercules Mulligan. I go, well, that's Busta Rhymes. Uh-huh. That's the most fucking awesome series of syllables. Hercules Mulligan. Like I heard it in Busta Rhymes' voice <laughs> when I read it on the page. So I was already yeah. casting hip hop stars right. as the founders the first time I'm reading the book. Uh-huh. And your guy who, uh, what's his name? David? Diggs. Yeah. Diggs. That he he was uh, a, a, it was interesting that the I, I don't know how long the casting process happened, yeah. But it was like it's a very profound thing, you know. Especially you know in 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 a time now where where you know aggressive politics is going to be part of our right. cultural reaction and language is that you know you're taking a story about one of the founders and you know not only integrating it but elevating it. Through, uh, you know, e- ethnic fluidity, which is a word I, I don't know if I made it up, but you understand what I'm saying. I, I do. That, that, y- y- you know, that represents a story that is about all of us. Yeah. And, y- you know, when you were casting that, what, what were your, what were you looking for exactly? I know you're honoring these, these, these voices in your head, but, you know, you gotta have, you know, real song and dance guys. Yeah. There? Yeah, and you've got to have the uh, ability to sing and dance and rap, and they don't teach you how to rap in musical theater conservatories. But was it a thing for you when you when you were casting, saying like, none of these guys are going to be white? No, it was. I, we never put down that dictum. It right. was. It was. We got to find the best people to do this, and we got to represent. Um, we have to represent the most sort of beautiful diversity of, of, of people we can find. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's New York, New York city. It's got to, the, the, the sort of the calling card was, this has got to look like the A train. Yeah. It's got to look like one car on the A train <laughs> and with all that represents <laughs> mariachi bands, uh, break dancers, whatever right, the fuck. Right. Um, and, and then you get this amazing story about a guy who's a flawed guy. They're all flawed. 
oh, they're also flawed. But yeah, but our, our, our main guy is, is deeply flawed. Um, cause he doesn't know when to shut the fuck up. Uh huh. Uh, and, and he doesn't keep his dick in his pants. And he doesn't keep his dick in his pants. And he, um, and the thing that is his strength is his undoing. You know, he, he writes his way off the island. He writes his way into Washington's good graces. And then when he's presented with the fact that he fucked up and some people know about it, he decides to tell the world, oh, yeah, I fucked this married lady, but I was always honest in my business affairs. And he thinks that's going to, like, save him. It was totally used against him. And you can also see that as an act of patriotism. You know, if the, the if there's stench around him as being a corrupt public figure as a guy who misuses treasury funds or misuses government funds in any way, you know, the country's five fucking years old. That that could be the end of it. So he instead blows up his personal spot. Um, you know, I, I got to, I got friends, I was friends with Mike Nichols before he passed. You were? And, uh, yeah, I got cast in a reading, uh, that he did shortly after in the Heights, sort of a reading of a play that nothing ever really happened with it. Um, but, we we went to dinner and this was before I'd written any of Hamilton. I said, I think I'm writing something about Hamilton. And he said, that's the greatest, that's the last honest American. He was a big Hamilton buff. Oh. And he always pointed to that moment of that guy ruined his life to save the Republic. Um, and, and his wife, like, taking the ultimate affront of blowing up his personal life and his infidelity and stuck by him. Like, he thinks those are the two of the most courageous Americans who ever lived. And he was at our last workshop before we opened at the public. That was the last time I saw him. How how often did you uh, counsel with him through the process of creating it? Um, not so much on this, just sort of checking in, and I would tell him, you know, I'm, I'm done, and we invited him to la- that last workshop, and I was so thrilled to to have him there. Uh, Tommy Kale, if, you know, there's a great quote uh, where if, if Tommy Kale had to make his Mount Rushmore of directors, he would say, Mike Nichols and Hal Prince twice. <laughs> 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 you know, those are the guys. Yeah. Um, and so, so, you know, I think the fact that he, he, he always respected Hamilton, the historical Hamilton. He was very, uh, he was very happy that the show, uh, was going to have a kind of a life. Um, and he was, he was a wonderful guy. The, the last email I had from him was just after my son was born. Um, just saying like, oh, it's, it's all different now. Yeah. Like, you, you're, you're going to find all new stuff. Yeah. And also, like, you, you, you know, with Hamilton, you know, you were able to deal with class. Mm-hmm. You were able to deal with an, a, not only just an immigrant story, but also a story about politics, about love, about, you know, desire to transcend your class. Yeah. And all the stuff that, you, you know, that are, that are conflicts and parts of the American experience now, obviously. Absolutely. Now, they're coming for me. I've said too much. I thought that was just your ride. I thought you were at that level now. <laughs> no, not yet. They're going to chopper you out. No. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go. <laughs> the ladder drops into the garage. But now, like, you know, dealing with, you know, as we were talking when you came in, that you said you were in route, in route from, uh, from London on election night, and you, you landed in this. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about your political consciousness. You know, you're a young man. And God bless you for saying so. <laughs> oh, come on. I'm 36. Yes. Yes, you're a young man. Thank you. That's very sweet. <laughs> and, you know, you, you know, your creative life evolved in, you know, a, a fairly, you know, restrictive political environment, you know, being the, the Bush years and everything else yeah. and that. And your political life, I guess, started then as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's, it, it's funny. I, I, I got, I got to my hotel after flying on election day and I jumped immediately into a big Skype session with the same group of friends that I've spent the last four elections with. It's my Wesleyan. So two Bush and one Obama. Two Bush and one Obama. Two, two Obamas. Um, got very stoned in 2000 waiting for a president to emerge. Yeah. And, you know, Wesleyan's a pretty left-leaning place. Um, I fell asleep, but my friends all went to Falls Hill and wailed and howled at the moon um, and just sort of wailed, like, how is this happening? Uh, 2004, uh, we were at my friend's house in the village, and no matter how many times we played Eminem's <laughs> anti-Bush song, it yeah. didn't break our way. And just remember and getting very sort of sourly drunk. And then 2008, we were in the same apartment and danced in the streets and danced right. in Union Square. Do you remember Remember, like, were, were you in uh, New York City uh, when 9/11 happened? Yeah, uh, I was on my way there because it was primary day. That was that was a voting day. Yeah, uh, and my dad was running Freddie's mayoral campaign, so yeah. I was going to drive down, vote, and come back. And it was also the day Bob Dylan's "Time Out of Mind" album came oh, out. Yeah, yeah. So the first thing I did in the morning was I knew I was driving to the city. 
I went to the record store in Middletown, Connecticut, Colony Records, uh, to buy the new Bob Dylan. And the very stoned, sleepy guy who runs that shop was like, hey, man, someone like tried to blow up the World Trade Center. And I said to him, yeah, that happened like eight years ago. Because I was thinking about the first time. Right, right. I was, the guy I, in the van. The guy in the van. Yeah. And I was like, this guy's really out of it. Yeah. And, and, and he said, no, man, it's a... And then got like very like clear-eyed and said, it's a really good day to buy a Bob Dylan record. Mm. And I popped it in my car. And then when I drove back home, I turned on the TV and the second plane was flying into the tower. And I remember just sort of people coming over to our house and serving serving drinks and calling family members and because uh, I was supposed to drive. And then we heard that Manhattan was sealed and I wasn't able to go down uh, because there was no one getting in or out. Uh, Were you able to get point. home? Uh, I got home a few days later. Wow. Um, and, uh, my dad was downtown. He saw it. He was running a campaign. Um, and, you know, in his mind, he says, Freddie Ferrer would be mayor if that hadn't happened because they suspended the election. Um, and then the other guy, you know, there, there was no hiring a Latino mayor after right. that happened. It was like, we're not, we're not fucking with that. We're not fucking with the system. We need to, right. you know, that and that, then that defined political discourse for another eight years. Yes. And the, you know, the, the element of, of immigrants and terrorism, you know, defines it again now. And it has always, you know, sort of like it, it trying to find a way forward, uh, you, you know, that would honor all people, uh, which is, is also what Hamilton does. So like, I mean, in, in, you know, and I've talked about this a little bit, but it, it because it's just happened. Yeah. But, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of people, in this country, you know, made a decision for whatever reason, you know, some better than others, and but they are people. But you know, the progressive fight of of you know racial lines and immigration, which is so much of what Hamilton speaks about, you, you know, what what as an artist, you know, how do you impulsively or you know now two or three days after, what do you feel going forward? What 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 has it been invigorated in you? Uh, well. You know, there's the initial despair that your candidate didn't win and the right. values that you believe in didn't win. And that's win. normal. And, and then, I, I don't know, I woke up with an enormous sense of moral clarity, mm-hmm. um, which, as you know, for progressives is always hard. Yeah. <laughs> clarity is never something that's <laughs> close to in the conversation. It's like, well, what about this? But what about this? But yeah. have you considered this perspective? Right. You know, we consider so many perspectives that right. sometimes we're, we're paralyzed. Right. Um, but in the face of this, it was like, well, this was a campaign. Uh, the campaign that won was run on the alienation of others. It was in the first speech Mexicans are sending over rapists and criminals. Mm -hmm. In the next speech, it was, we're going to ban all the Muslims. And so my first thought was, okay, our job is to make the Americans he's alienating feel safe. Like, that's my job through my art, and that's my job through my work, and... And, you know, if Hamilton's anything, it's a reminder that as complicated as those founders were, we live in their country and great shit has happened in this country, too. And it's our country, too. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I sort of woke up being like, okay, well, we need to hold the line on the things we believe in and not not slide backwards. Yeah. and, And not be pushed out. And not be pushed out and not be, and not be silenced by the things we believe. That's right. You know, that's, that's, that's the important thing is, is, you know, uh, you know, People will protest. People protested Obama forever, and I didn't agree with those protesters. But you know, let let them do it. That's why we get to live here. Yeah. Um. And 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 now the same. It's the pendulum is, is swung the other way, and we can't shut up, and we got to continue to fight for our values. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, and and I, 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 the this movie, like I watched a couple of clips of the animated movie. Yeah, Moana. Oh, what a dream! It's good though. I, it's I mean, so the, the small great. clips I saw. It's like you know, I I don't again. I, yeah, I'm I, I'm uh, you know a little uh, closeted musical fan. And oh, I'm, you're I'm straight like, out the closet. We heard you sing Herod. <laughs> Welcome. We welcome you with open arms. You're safe here, Mark. <laughs> and uh, but like I don't watch a lot of animated, but I watched two clips of uh, Moana. It's yeah. called, and I was like, oh, this yeah. Is, I, this I, I I don't want to put politics on Disney, but I'm just so grateful that there's like a it's a movie with like a kick-ass female character saving the world, and she doesn't have a love interest. She doesn't have a boyfriend. She like sails into the sea and saves the fucking world. And um, I'm really proud to be a part of it and and have contributed music to it.
Well, I, I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thanks. And, uh, you know, and I, uh, it's an I'm honor pr- to have you here and I, and I'm really, uh, humbled by the fact that you love the show so much and that night you, that you did that on stage was very, uh, yeah. very moving for me. Thanks for, thanks for, for all the interviews and thanks for getting so much honesty out of so many people we love. You know, I, I think of so many of your interviews and be like, I never, um, I never saw that person in that way before. Right, and, right, you know, right. if the beginning of art is empathy, is walking, like you give us a master class in it every time you get someone in this crazy garage of yours. Yeah. So, so thank you for that. Yeah. And I had to learn that. I, you know, <laughs> I was a pretty selfish guy for a long time, but yeah. I, you know, like I needed to talk to you today. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm a little shook up. Yeah. We all are. Okay. Thanks, man. <laughs> That's it. What a lovely man. What a great show, great artist. I was, uh, I was honored to have him over. Thanks again to Sonos for sponsoring today's show. Sonos is the smart speaker system that streams all your favorite music to any room or every room. Control your music with one simple app and fill your home with pure, immersive sound. Sonos lets you control everything from songs to volume to which rooms you want to play them in. You have endless options for listening all over your house, and it sounds great. It does. Go to Sonos.com for more. S O. N O S dot com. I believe I will play guitar. I believe oh I have not planned anything, but that hasn't stopped me before. Today's episode is sponsored by MeUndies. MeUndies only cares about making the most comfortable underwear you've ever experienced. MeUndies are twice as soft as cotton. How can you ever have a truly bad day if your underwear is that soft? MeUndies will deliver your new favorite pair of underwear right to your door. A better day guaranteed. You can only get them on the MeUndies website with free shipping in the U.S. and Canada. Everyone listening to this gets 20% off their first order. Go to MeUndies.com slash WTF. That's 20% off your first order, MeUndies.com slash WTF. We're also sponsored today by Sonos. Sonos is the smart speaker system that streams all your favorite music to any room or every room. Control your music with one simple app and fill your home with pure, immersive sound. I've got it in my living room, my bedroom, the bathroom, and right here in the garage. I can play a different song out here while people in the house are listening to something else, or I can blast the same track in every room. Check out more at Sonos.com. That's S-O-N-O-S dot com. All right, let's do the show. (laughs) All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fuck nicks? What the fucking eastas? What's happening? I'm Mark Marin. This is my show, WTF. Welcome to it. Happy you're here. Hope you're holding up. I should tell you that my guest today is the uh, creator of uh, the musical Hamilton. He wrote and performed uh, in it uh, an amazing piece of work. Lynn manuel Miranda is here today. Talk to him in a little bit. What's happening? I will be in Nashville at the James K. Polk Theater this Saturday, the 19th. You can go to WTFPod.com for tickets. I'm also going to be in Chicago. Chicago is on December 3rd. Two shows at the Vic. A 7.30 and a 10, I believe. Again, WTFPod.com slash tour. You get the information for tickets, links to tickets. Come on out. Let's hang out and talk. Let's hang out and talk. I did a very... um courageous and uh, somewhat uh, scary thing today, a 
I I did you know I did something I I didn't think I would do I didn't think I had it in me to do it, um, but maybe uh, some of you can do it too. I don't know. I maybe it's not right for you. Maybe it's too much. But uh, I'm pretty proud of myself. I'm proud to be American, uh, and I'm also proud that uh, that I took Twitter off my phone. Fucking gone. Hit the little X, watched it go away, and felt a relief. I felt a freedom from the bondage of self-induced post-traumatic stress disorder, of feeling the need to connect and react to a never-ending stream of garbage from the Internet cesspool. I'm not saying that about my friends. You can all fight the good fight how you're going to fight it, but uh, I needed to collect my thoughts. I needed to look around me. I needed to uh, be in my car and not risking my life to uh, to react angrily to a tweet. I haven't really tweeted much in a couple of days because I, I, I don't, the energy is being misused. There's no way to uh, let love in and uh, figure out what the next right thing to do is if you're constantly consumed and jacking your goddamn endorphins and jacking your uh, cortisol levels. To, to skyrocketing survival heights just by engaging with eggs and uh, hostile avatars of different sorts, the uh, the fronts of cowards and just people that want to annoy you. Fuck it. I got it off my phone. And now I can walk in. It's weird. You get this. It's almost like a phantom limb thing where you I reach for my phone. I'm like, ugh. It's not there. Whew, a little bit of panic. Hey, wait a minute. Say hi to that guy. How's it going, man? I'm all right. What? That's a sample of dog food? I don't have dogs. I have cats. Curly, uh, clearly an odd reference, but it just happened down at the pet food store. So look, I'm trying to get on with my life and process my feelings, but it does hang over you like some sort of uh, chronic diagnosis, you know? Well, yeah, hey, that was, I was, that was a pretty good omelet. Oh, God. That's that's happening. I think I can go see a movie. That was that was a good movie. That was great. It was a sci-fi movie, kind of a fantasy that was sort of uplifting, alien save the world kind of thing. Yeah, I just went and saw uh, Arrival. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. I'm going to think about it a little bit. Oh my God, that's still happening. It still happened. So that you know that that's going to be the way it is uh, for those of us who feel that way. And yeah, there's there's two sides to everything. But look, you know, I I went out and uh, did some comedy. I started to really kind of parse, you know, what it means to be a comic, to stand up, and 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 be heard, and be funny, and not to be uh, too strident, but try to figure it out from a human point of view. That's the problem with the right now with the vulnerability element is that we you know we have to maintain vulnerability and we have to move through the world with courage and and a certain shamelessness of uh, who we are and and you know what we do and and what we contribute to the world now things that were once comfortable are uncomfortable and that could just mean going to the fucking store for some people but we are all Americans and uh you know we some of us got to push back some of us got to fight some of us got to resist do whatever you need to do to make your life mean something and to help other people. To help other people. And the cats. Got to help the cats. Right? With the holidays almost here, you don't have time to go to the post office. There's traffic and parking and it will be packed with everyone mailing holiday gifts and packages. So do what I do. Use Stamps.com instead. With Stamps.com, you can avoid all the hassle of going to the post office during the busy holiday season. Everything you would do at the post office, you can do right from your desk. Buy and print official U.S. postage using your own computer and printer. Print postage for any letter or package. The instance you need it. Then the mail carrier just picks it up. It's only $15.99 $15.99 a month. That's it. No long-term multi-year commitments like those postage meters require and no markups on postage. In fact, you'll even get special postage discounts with Stamps.com. I use it, and you should too. Right now, sign up for Stamps.com and use my promo code WTF for this special offer. Start a four-week trial plus a $110 bonus offer, including postage and a digital... So it was in those boxes. She said he took very good care of them. And that, uh, you know, she couldn't move around, you know, every time she moved, she had to swept these boxes. And it felt heavy to me. But then I felt like 
I not only do I love records, and of course I want records, but I will appreciate them. I can be the custodian, you know, obviously not entirely emotionally, but of these records, and and you know, and and accept the responsibility. I know some of you are thinking like some responsibility getting a bunch of free records, but I thought it was a lovely gesture, and I didn't take it lightly. And there are some great records in there, things I never heard before, things that I avoided, some prog rock that I just never. Never really paid attention to. There's some records in there that I think that maybe, maybe this gift is something I don't even understand yet. That somewhere in her father's collection might be a record that changes my fucking life. So, I, I, I hope she knows that, uh, that that could happen. That could happen. I'll let her know. Her name's Kristen. And, um, it's lovely to meet her. And, and I, and I feel the weight of the records and I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to listen to new things, and I'm going to uh, honor your late old man. So thank you for those. All right. Do, do, you, do you find yourself without any time to read the things you want to read? Audible is the perfect solution. Get audiobooks and listen to them on the go, at the gym, during your commute, anytime. Audible.com has audiobooks from leading publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazines, newspapers, and more. Their app is free and works on iPhones, iPads, Androids, and Windows phones. You can also download and listen on your Kindle Fire in over 500 MP3 players. If you want some suggestions, how about getting Hamilton, The Revolution, which is co-written and narrated by our guest today, Lynn manuel Miranda. Or you can listen to the book that inspired Lynn to write Hamilton, Ron Chernow's unabridged biography of Alexander Hamilton. Audible.com also has the great listen guarantee. If you decide you don't like the book you choose, no worries. You can exchange any book you aren't happy with for another title anytime, no questions asked. Audible.com is offering a free 30-day trial membership. Go to audible.com slash WTF today to start your free trial. That's audible.com slash WTF. So what's the point, right? What's the point? Well, I think the point is you got to find the courage to be who you are. Look, there's a lot of people out there, left, right, people dealing with addiction, exclusion, you know, broken hearts, grief, angry, angry hope. Reluctant hope, complete defeat. But fuck it, man. You know, we got to be who we are, and you got to believe who you are as a good person, and and you got to act on that now. And you got to be aware and vigilant of, of people that, that need some support. We got to get each other's backs. All people. Seriously. I, you know, I'm a reluctant optimist, but I'm not going to surrender to PTSD of, uh, the onslaught of, uh, social media platforms or anything else. You know, sometimes in this life, it requires courage just to go out in the morning. You know, sometimes for people, that's the courage has to have every day. They got to deal with that for years. That's just the way it is. But um I'm wary, but I feel good. My guest today is uh Lynn Manuel Miranda, who uh created the musical Hamilton, which I saw in New York, and it was phenomenal. And it was a beautiful there's nothing better than people collaborating to do something amazing and proactive. That, that I can tell you. And in, in the arts, that's certainly something that enriches life. Don't forget that if you're in the arts, because Hamilton was a, a real transcendent experience for a lot of reasons that I was able to talk to Lynn about. And, uh, I, maybe if you don't listen to the show all the time, I told you about how when I was there, um, he knew where I was sitting and as they were doing their curtain call, he looked over at me and, uh, he mouthed, Boomer lives. That was pretty nice, pretty nice moment. And it was like, it was amazing to sit here and talk to him. He's doing, uh, he co-wrote the, the music and performed some of the songs for the new Disney movie, Moana. Lynn and I do a little singing. I will tell you that. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. This is me talking to, uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda 
here in the garage. You want cans? Sure. Have you heard me ask that before, Lynn Manuel? Oh, please pronounce it Manuel. Just call Manuel? Me, call Lynn me Manuel? Lynn. Yeah, that's much better. And Lynn Man- Manuel, I can do. Yeah. I can do you it. You can also just do Lynn. That's fine. Is it? Yeah, yeah. I was told by people that you absolutely will walk out <laughs> if I say Lynn. They're very sweet to protect me, but it's actually what I've been called on. Lynn Manuel. Yeah. I can do it, man. I grew up in New Mexico. <laughs> I can, I can, I can make the right sounds. All right. So how do you? How often do you come out here? This is all. This is a new world for you. I've only ever been out here for for work. I had, yeah. a, I had a really surreal. Um, my first show uh, in the Heights played the Pantages. Right. And I lived. My first experience living in L.A. was living in the W on Hollywood and Vine. The worst. I mean, it, the Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Yeah. For real. Oh, so you had to walk across that sad street with guys in costumes. It, guys in costumes. <laughs> and also like, but also like homeless teens coming out of the yeah, train that no one takes. And next to like this hotel where Drake is upstairs. Right. So it's the dream and the dream deferred on the same corner. Right. Uh, and how long were you here? I was here for five weeks doing the, uh, acting in that show. That's right. That was the first musical you wrote and mm-hmm. directed and produced. I didn't direct. No, no. Tommy Kale, who directed Hamilton. Directed the same guy too. you've been with forever. Yeah, yeah. He's my dude. Like, I feel bad. I, I've not seen uh, In the Heights. That's all right. No, no it's it's not all right. <laughs> I, I, I feel terrible. I <laughs> Because I know it was the first one. It was. It was. It, I mean, and nothing will ever be that. Like, I went from broke substitute teacher to Broadway composer when yeah. that opened. And you you were broke substitute teacher, but you weren't acting. You were, you, I mean, you were doing things. I was trying to act. The only role I'd gotten was I was a bellhop on the last season of The Sopranos. I'm try- I just watched it. Scale. Don't wait. Go to stamps.com. Before you do anything else, click on the microphone at the top of the home page and type in WTF. That's stamps.com. Enter WTF. It was good to get out and do some comedy. See the see the the other comedians at the store, how they're doing it, what's happening, communing with the folks who come out with the audiences, speaking your truth. Can't stop that. It was good, man. It was good. When things get hairy and things get scary, uh, I didn't plan out that rhyming. The, uh, the intensity of, of life in front of you, you know, vibrates with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, an immediacy. You know, it's a, it's, it's a time now. If you're feeling, uh, vulnerable to lean on people that you love, get closer to people, go out in the world, say hi to people, make sure people are, you know, being nice, maybe saying hello to the, uh, to the clearly sad person, help people that need help. Leonard Cohen passed away, 82. Great run. Left some amazing work, which is the best you can really hope to do in this life. And I spent the other night, the night that he passed away, or the night that I heard he passed away, spinning some of those uh, albums. Songs from a Room, I think, is uh, the one I listened to. And I was a, I was a late comer to Leonard Cohen. I, I tried and I tried and I always knew he was great and I, and I knew it was good, but it was not connecting with me. And I guess it's maybe, maybe just for me, it was as I got older, I could deal with it. And I, you know, and I'm a poetry guy. There's no doubt about that. I'm not necessarily a lyrics guy, but I'm definitely a poetry guy. And, and just, uh, some of it got so much deeper for me as, as I got older, and I guess as he got older, but I went back way back and listened to 12 songs. And uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to have the work that that guy did. A real Zen master, a real Buddha of the song. He will be missed, but we have his stuff. We have his stuff. That's the beautiful thing about music. You have the stuff. And this other very uh, wonderful thing happened, and I, I don't really use the word wonderful that much because I, I don't love it don't I don't love the word but uh, uh, someone reached out to me a fan of the show and she she just said that you know she had all these records uh, that she wanted to give to me and you know I don't know who she is and she doesn't know if the Twitter accounts really me so I, I you know I message her I go is this for real yeah of course I'd love to 
to take some records off your hands. And she goes, yes. And, you know, we met at my office and she brought over like 600 records, vinyl records that I find out were her, her late father's collection. And, and it, it, it almost felt like this, you know, you know, I could tell that it was a heavy thing. This is a loaded, a loaded shipment that I'm getting, but she needed to let go of it. And I offered her money. She didn't want money. She just wanted them to be appreciated. And uh, I had no idea.